Ladies and gentlemen, Federal Minister, Presidents and Representatives of the G7 Science Academies, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you. It's great to see you in person. After so many months and moments of digital and online events, it's great to have real faces in front of me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. And welcome here in Berlin. Welcome in the Museum for Communication for the Science 7 Dialogue Forum 2022. In January 2022, Germany took over the presidency of the Group of Seven leading industrial states and the annual meeting of the heads of state and government will take place, as we all know, at the end of June at Schloss Elmau. And now, under the leadership of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, the science academies of the G7 countries convening in the Science 7 format have developed evidence-based statements related to the topics of the summit agenda. What does it include? This includes antiviral drugs for pandemic preparedness. This includes also global health challenges posed by zoonosis and antimicrobial resistance, or the impact of climate change on polar regions and oceans, and concrete measures for decarbonization. And today, ladies and gentlemen, at our Science 7 Dialogue Forum, these joint recommendations will be presented and, of course, discussed with all of you with all of you and with you in our live stream. So thanks for tuning in today also on the social media channels. And of course, these Science 7 statements 2022 will be handed over to the German G7 presidency. These joint recommendations will be available now already by online or on the QR code. You will find the QR code to download all the recommendations in your program folder. We wanted to save a little bit of paperwork. My name is Katie Gallus. I'm a geographer and international journalist, and I'm very pleased and excited to be your moderator of today. I'm excited to hear from you what keeps you going in these times. What are your questions in these times? Therefore, we established enough time in our Q&A sessions for your driving questions. Please share your thoughts and your questions with us. Our dialogue forum, as I mentioned, will be also broadcasted uh, on the Leopoldina YouTube channel. It will be also recorded. And again, to all of you joining us virtually, a warm welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, we would have loved to have you here in person, but of course, it's, it's a crazy time we're all living in. We're also online on the social media channel, so please also share your thoughts with our hashtag, hashtag Chi7Science. And the translation devices are also available for the audience here in the Museum of Communication. We have two different channels, a German and an English channel. So these were some organizational information from my side. For the official welcome, and the introduction. I warmly welcome now the president of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, Professor Dr. Gerald Haug. Federal Minister Schmidt, Presidents, and representatives of the G7 Science Academies. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Science 7 Dialogue Forum. After two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm overwhelmed to welcome so many participants from around the world and from Germany to this wonderful uh, endeavor. We have scientists, academy representatives and officials from all G7 states um, and several of the G20 countries with us. Some of you had quite a long journey. Thank you for your commitment. In particular, we are honored by the presence of Anatoly Zagorodny, 
Professor Anatoly Zagorodny, the president of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. Thank you very much for coming to Berlin in these very difficult times. Please be assured of our full solidarity and support. I look forward to your discussion and our discussion in the afternoon um, on how we as academies can help Ukraine's scientific community to also rebuild its future. Russia's war of aggression has put the global peace order at risk. Two other global challenges are the climate crisis and the pandemic. This is the case for our G7 leaders when they meet at Schloss Elmau in four weeks, but also for us as a science and research community. As National Academy, the Leopoldina is honored to chair the Science 7 process in the context of Germany's science uh, G7 presidency. Sometimes you wish the heads of the country would have it so easy to be consensual as our world is. Together with our partner academies, we have been providing scientific policy advice to the G7 summits for more than 15 years. After half a year of intense consultations, we as Science 7 Academies are proud to present our joint statements today, hand them over to the G7 Presidency and discuss our recommendations with the public. At the Museum of Communication, we have a perfect place for all of this. It fits perfectly with what uh, is the heart of the Science 7 process. Research, dialogue and exchange to find solutions to the greatest challenges of our time. I'm grateful to the museum director, Anja Schablushke and Dietrich Wolfenner for the opportunity to have us, our conference at this wonderful setting. Thank you very much. Federal Minister Schmidt, ladies and gentlemen, Germany took over the presidency of the G7 in very challenging times. Many priorities of the G7 agenda are gained even greater urgency in view of the changed global situation. Under the leadership of the Leopoldina, the G7 Science Academies have prepared joint statements on central topics of the G7 Summit. With our recommendations, we aim to ensure that up-to-date science is appropriately reflected in high-level policy discussions at the G7 level. Please allow me to briefly introduce the most important recommendations and what science has to say to basically two major pillars. First, protect the climate, the environment and biodiversity and to accelerate the global energy transition. And second, increase the pandemic preparedness and strengthen global health with a One Health approach in mind. It's pretty much clear what needs to be done. With the S7 statements, the Academy provide once again, just as a doctor would do, a clear diagnosis and propose concrete therapy measures. It is key in, in these statements that we need to view the Earth as a system, a very complex system. The first two statements are basically on the climate and the, cli the connected climate energy uh, issue. So the title of the first statement is, called, is Ocean and Cryosphere. The need for urgent international action. The word urgent is important here. Polar regions and the polar oceans are the most important early warning uh, systems for climate change still particularly vulnerable to it, with rising temperatures in the Arctic and the Antarctic, shrinking sea ice, 
and the thawing of permafrost. That leads to global sea level rise, which is accelerating to fundamental changes in the planet's carbon cycle or the Earth albedo effect. The measures that need to be taken urgently are, and that's not new, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It was my fatherly friend and mentor, Wally Broker, who coined the word in 1973, and that was global warming. 1973, I was five years old then. We need to strengthen the capacity of the ocean's biosphere to contribute to climate mitigation. We need to enhance the scientific cooperation and data sharing for Earth observation and forecasting systems. And I would say our world, there's always space for improvement, but we're pretty good in that. So one thing we do observe, if we look in the middle of the Pacific to Mauna Loa, and, the, and there's the so-called Keeling CO2 curve, that the air we breathe has a CO2 concentration of 421 ppm. In 10 years, it will be 450 ppm. That's by chance my research target, it's the Pliocene warm interval. It will be then higher than ever in the last three million years. And that was a world which was much warmer than two degrees Celsius. So by then, and that's in about 10 to 15 years, the two degree target of Paris is gone. So we are clearly not on track. Last year, the highest emission of planet Earth have been recorded, that we've ever recorded, seven years after the Paris Agreement. And there's still much talk about a one and a half target. It's very desirable, but almost scientifically dishonest to talk about it. It's gone. So the therapy is also clear. So the second statement is called decarbonization. The case for urgent international action. Again, there's the word urgent. That's really meaningful uh, here. And the goal is net zero emissions until 2050. However, we've been probably never further away from even a turnaround in that Keeling curve when it comes to admitting CO2 and measuring there on Mona Loa. The measures that urgently need to be taken to reach this goal is we do need to build a carbon neutral, diverse and resilient energy system. And yes, we can. And it's financially sensible. Therefore, we need to increase the international cooperation, not only in research to get those last bits and pieces into innovation done to decarbonize. I think the technology is are in our hands. We need the international cooperation of our countries, and I think we do need to establish somewhat a global carbon pricing system, which would be the sharpest knife we have. And I, and I think I speak for all my colleagues here, if we do not implement such uh, a, a system with the G7 in the driver's seat, the two degree target, and I said two degree, cannot be reached. So we need to promote international partnership on climate and also promote those appropriate climate financing investments. I was last Thursday here in Berlin and I, I had a short impulse for the G7 ministers on climate, environment and energy. And it was a lovely very well-intentioned 39-page paper that came out of that. The mood was, get, was great, the atmosphere, the vibration was good. However, that 39-pager is again not good enough to meet the two-degree Paris climate goal. It's just not appropriately specific, and we have to do, we have to do get specific. And I hope, Minister Schmidt, the summit is happening that you, and I know you will try to do those important steps. The second part of the statements relates to the pandemic. So there the, the diagnosis is, is also straightforward. We've experienced with SARS-CoV-2 that the world was in a lack of preparedness for, and this is probably still true, emerging pathogens and uh, with pandemic potential. Rapid development of vaccines against COVID-19, which was a huge success, we, we 
all appreciate it, has however eclipsed the discussion about urgent need for specific or broad spectrum antiviral drugs. The measures to be taken in order to increase pandemic preparedness are threefold, summarized here. Greater support for the development of specific broadly effective antiviral drugs by establishing long-term funding mechanisms. Create the adequate infrastructure for, for conducting efficient clinical trials. And I think we've learned a lot from the partnership with, between BioNTech and Pfizer, how, how that could go forward. And that was a wonderful success story where science and industry and, and, and at the world basically has interacted to deliver us those vaccines at a very short amount of time. And that needs to an improved coordination of international activity in the large field of pandemic preparedness. And that led us to the fourth statement on a One Health approach. As basically we've learned that pandemic preparedness is not enough. The prevention, the prevention of pandemics is what we could see as a long-term therapy. The key idea of a One Health approach is that the health of humans, animals and the environment are closely linked and interdependent. Again, the Earth as a system. Important, an important approach in the context of zoonosis, it's a, obviously a disease transmitted from animals to humans and vice versa. And there it's, it's very closely interconnected between climate change, biodiversity loss, and the human pressure on ecosystems for further accelerating the threat of, of zoonosis. If we don't learn to deal with the Earth, the complex system, um, I think the next of those catastrophes uh, will be on its way. Same time, there's a significant increase of antimicrobial resistance, the AMR, uh, making it very difficult to treat those diseases. And we just had a, a pre-discussion and, and uh, there was a group of uh, also industry people at, uh, at the Chancellery that we need to find a way in, in however you call this private-public partnership that we uh, get the appropriate incentives to also develop novel antibiotics. The following measures uh, must be taken to initiate long-term therapy and make it successful. Concrete actions are the implementation of such a one health uh, approach. And we do have and we do need to use new digital technologies to effectively monitor the zoonotic diseases and AMR, plus then the development, as said before, of novel antibiotics. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, science has one great advantage. Science does not need to be overly pragmatic. The task of scientists is to provide the best available scientific evidence to point out the progress and uncertainties and to leave the decisions to democratically elected politicians. From discussions with, with decision makers over the last few months, I know that the German G7 presidency attaches great importance to science. I'm therefore particularly delighted that Wolfgang Schmidt is with us today. He's the head of the federal chancellery and federal minister for special tasks. And I might add, he has been one of the closest advisors to federal chancellor Olaf Scholz for more than 20 years. Minister Schmidt has agreed to give us a keynote speech on the priorities on the German G7 presidency in view of the changed global situation. After your keynote, I kindly invite you to remain on stage for the official handover of the signed seven statements. Minister Schmidt, the floor is yours. Dear Professor Haug, dear Excellencies, dear 
S7 delegates and ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for inviting me and um, thank you for taking the time to sharing your recommendations with us. Obviously, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor, would have loved to be with you to receive these recommendations in person, but as you all know, the war in, against Ukraine also takes its toll on the agenda of politicians, so he has to be in Brussels today on this extraordinary European Council, but he sends his best regards and me um, to listen to you and to learn from you. I'm very happy to doing that, um, as I used to be responsible uh, on the part of the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg uh, a few years back when um, the then chancellor held the G20 in Hamburg, and I witnessed how important this dialogue with civil society is, and it is a good tradition both in the G7 but also in the G20 to have this outreach, as it's called, and the dialogue with the civil society. And today's event is part of that and a very important part of it, indeed, because you, as the national academies, are probably best placed to confront the leaders, as Professor Haug already started doing, um, with scientific um, and very complex realities and to challenge leaders to cope with the problems and the challenges that we are facing. The dialogue with the civil society includes not only Science 7, but also NGOs, trade unions, business society, youth and women. So it's um, actually seven groups that we are meeting and it's my pleasure to be with you today and I'm looking very much forward to the discussion that we will have afterwards. Um, but also to the recommendations, which I already read, obviously. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what the priorities of the presidency are, but as you all know, on the 24th of um, February this year, the brutal attack of um, Putin's Russia on Ukraine changed a lot of things and also the priorities for the G7 presidency. Um, the leaders already met several times, one time in person, several times in video conferences, and um, the main item on the agenda obviously was this unlawful war. And so I'm very happy um, that uh, you, Professor Haug, invited your colleague from Ukraine, um, Professor Sago Rodney um, to with, with us here, I'm very pleased. Um, and I also learned that um, the science community is um, looking into ways and supporting also their colleagues in Ukraine, and I think it's a wonderful example of solidarity. Um, if we look at the attack that um, Putin's Russia undertook against um, a peace-loving uh, Ukraine, we see that um, this is adding to crises that we already witnessed and that we have to deal with. So, yeah. more experience of us still remember the global financial crisis with its impact on the global economy. Um, we had to deal with the health crisis in the last nearly three years, a global pandemic, um, and obviously we have the underlying climate crisis that um, we have to deal with. And, and all these are reflected in the German G7 presidency's priorities, but now this war has put additional priorities on the agenda. And um, even though it is the G7 that is meeting, I think it is important to remember that this war in Europe has an impact worldwide. And that is why Chancellor Scholz also visited Africa and talked with his colleagues in Senegal, in Niger, and in South Africa. And um, their main question is, what are you doing to do about food security and about rising energy prices? So I think it is also a good sign that you invited the um, president of the Indonesian 
um, National Academy, as Indonesia at the moment has the G20 presidency and the G7 and the G20 presidency should go hand in hand. And this global food crisis is one that we should not forget and it is one that we put high on our agenda. Um, we aim to found an alliance um, which is called the Global Alliance for Food Security together with the World Bank and other international organizations. And um, obviously one of the um, objectives of the G7 meeting is to discuss with the invited countries um, from the global south. So India, Indonesia, um, but also Senegal, South Africa and Argentina about the emerging food crisis. Germany already has pledged 430 million um, to, uh, to fight against this food crisis, but much more is needed, as we all know. And I hope that we see some more concrete, as you urged us, um, results on the G7 um, on that as well. We all know that a strong coordination is needed also to fight the food crisis, and that is, I think, what we can expect um, from the G7 meeting in Schloss Elmau later this month. But at the same time, the, the underlying crises and the underlying and urging items remain important. And that is why I wanted to discuss a little bit about the five core criteria that we defined in our G7 presidency. The first one is that um, leaders will talk about a sustainable planet. So this planet. So this is about climate change. And I will go um, a bit more into details a little bit later. The second one is economic stability and transformation because um, also nearly three years of COVID have an impact on the world economy. We see rising debt levels, problems with debt sustainability in many emerging markets and developing countries. Um, we see inflation um, and we see these high energy prices having an impact um, on uh, budgets and we see high, higher interest rates um, with the Federal Reserve in the US and so um, capital is already going from emerging markets and developing countries and uh, putting budgets under more stress than ever. And then the third item is healthy life, so that um, concurs with what your recommendations deal with, especially with pandemic preparedness, but going beyond with the One Health um, idea. And the fourth thing that leaders will talk about is the investment in a better future, and that also has to deal with the question of um, how to finance um, our way into a net zero economies, the sooner the better. And the last one is one that I find very important in the context of the G7, because all the others could obviously be dealing with in the G20 context as well, and that is this idea of being stronger together and um, discussing how to defend liberal democracies, um, especially when it comes to the internet and um, a way of um, that we provide platforms, free speech and exchange that are misused uh, by enemies of um, the democracy. And I think it is important that G7 leaders talk about that and talk about influence and how we can make our democracies more resilient. Um, as you, Professor Haug, mentioned, um, Science 7 came up with seven recommendations, and I'm very grateful that you also focused and didn't provide the, what was it, 36 pages, um, but have a rather comprehensive um, set of recommendations. And I'm also grateful that you didn't stop by describing the challenges, but putting concrete recommendations for action. I can't promise you that leaders will just check 
and um, subscribe to everything what you said, but I think it is an important impulse for the discussions and that we will have later on. I do see many linkages going through your recommendations, which what the priorities of our presidency are and what we think the outcome of um, the G7 meeting should be. So I'm very grateful for that kind of, um, for that kind of input. And um, on the climate question, because we all know that this is the most urging one, and um, I, I heard you saying we need to be more concrete, um, I'd like to add one thing that um, Chancellor Scholz um, puts a lot of emphasis on, and that is the idea of a global climate club. It's not an inclusive club or exclusive in the sense of um, members only and, and high barriers for membership, like London style. It is rather an inclusive, it's an open club. But you mentioned the scientific idea of a global carbon pricing, and that indeed should be aimed for. But the reality is that we have different countries with different ideas, and most probably this good idea of a globally adjusted um, CO2 pricing will not be reached within the next years. Um, and the problem that we will face then, that countries or regions like Europe will start to protect their own industries from carbon leakage, so that companies that face high CO2 pricing or similar measures um, will then be tempted to move to other regions where such a CO2 pricing is not in place. And so the measurement against it will be CBEMS, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. And the problem that we see is that if we don't act now, we will have several different systems of CBEMS in place around the world. And we will have for those countries like the US that will most probably not see a carbon price, um, we will probably see trade tensions or even trade wars um, from regions that then fight against these kind of CBEMs uh, saying these are non-tariff barriers um, that go against WTO rules. And in order to prevent that and to make the different um, tools and measures by different countries and regions comparable, the idea of a climate club emerged. And we hope that this idea that Olaf Scholz as finance minister kicked around and introduced at G7 and G20 level with the in the finance track will be endorsed by the leaders as well in Elmo. It's not easy because there is resistance, there's reluctance, especially from those who do not have a carbon pricing, but we hope that we can achieve it. So the first one will be to make the different implicit and explicit carbon prices comparable, and the second one will be to set goals and more concrete goals for certain sectors. So for example, what is actually green hydrogen. And there need to be an understanding, an international understanding on that. And the third one is, as the club needs to be inclusive, um, the question of how do we get those countries on board that have difficulties in meeting um, the goals and that will have Will find, financially, it will find it financially difficult to actually engage in reducing um, CO2 emissions. And there is the idea of just energy transition partnerships. One is already signed with South Africa, and we hope that we can engage with many more. So this idea of, of the Climate Club will be at the center um, of um, the discussions that we would like to have um, in Schloss Elmau later this month. And I hope that we can get more substantial progress and more concrete um, results there as well. Um, as I said, I think it is important to not only have the G7 um, as the most important industrialized countries 
working together, but it is equally important to discuss these issues in the broader context. The war and Russian's aggression make it very difficult in the G20 context um, to doing that. Um, and the G20 still has to figure it out um, how to deal with the announced presence of President Putin at the meeting in Bali later this year. Um, but therefore, in order to prepare this and in order to not make it the West against Putin plus friends and probably a BRICS plus world, it is important to reach out to other countries. And that is why, as I mentioned, um, Chancellor Scholz invited these five countries from the Global South to really engage with them um, and discuss the items that I mentioned. So I'm looking very much forward to that G7. I think it is more important than never. The idea is a little bit to go back to what um, former Chancellor Schmidt um, and Giscard d'Estaing had in mind when they founded the G7 back then, I think it was G6, and that is kind of fireside chats among leaders about, about the most pressuring questions um, of um, the world. And we tried to to, to, to make sure that leaders have the time to actually discuss in person um, about these pressuring issues. Because they have the same problem that all of you had during the last two and a half years. Video conferences are good in order to um, save travel time, but they're very bad for real discussion and engagement. And so I think it is absolutely crucial that they have these two and a half days to sit together and to really discuss profoundly and to come up with solutions. And in order to have um, good discussions, it is important to have good substance. And so I close this by really thanking you for providing your recommendations and your insight for this kind of discussion. And uh, now I'm happy to receiving them officially, and later on I'm happy to discussing them more in detail with you and learn from you what in your recommendations the most important points are. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you very much for coming here and um, looking forward to the future exchange. Thank you very much. So, Min Minister Schmidt, thank you very much for that wonderful keynote address. We, we do appreciate your openness, even the face of, in the face of those uh, obvious great challenges which lie ahead of us. Thank you also for rec um, responding quite directly to our little hard recommendations, but that's the way forward. Uh, I'm very much convinced that we will continue that productive dialogue between science and politics in the coming month uh, and, and also the year. And thanks again um, for um, giving, this, giving this opportunity um, to the scientific world for this very important summit, which I think the world is watching. So I, I ask now, first, we have two rounds of photographs with the handover. First, the G7 presidents who have co-prepared the, the statement, and then we have a second round of, of photographs with the, the president of the Indonesian and the Ukrainian Academy as an extended family photo. So, Please, first the G7 presidencies and take off your badges. They don't look so good.
Exactly. We have two photographers to your right and to your left. So please give us the biggest smiles, of course, at that day, that important day of the handover, when the joint recommendations will be officially handed over. Yes, the name badge. Sorry, I just jump in. Would you give me your name badge? Take off your name badge off. Take off your name badge. That doesn't look so pretty. Yeah, wonderful. All right, again, to the left and to the right, please. Two photographers. And maybe this photo will go to die a little bit viral on our social media. So please join again with the hashtag G7Science. Share your photos, of course, with the Leopoldina family. At least it's a try, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Have fruitful discussions and debates. A little bit more backstage and in private, but we also continue oops, to discuss and debate. Thank you. Watch the stair. Yeah, it's a little bit higher than a normal step, I guess. Thank you very much. This is your round of applause again. Thank you. All right, they go into private, into private room and um, have a little bit more time for further debates and discussions. And again, it's time to have, of course, a minute here to rearrange the stage for you a bit. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the joint recommendations are, of course, accessible and available for you via the QR code in the program folder, or they are also printed out here, but we tried to be without paper. Um, so use the opportunity to download the joint recommendations via the QR code and share your thoughts, of course, with us on the social media platforms, but of course also in a minute here on stage. Wonderful, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are and we were just listening to these words, difficult times that we are living in with several crises at the same time when we look at the climate crisis and the pandemic crisis and of course the law against Ukraine. We have different challenges to tackle, but what's a non-negotiable when it comes, when we think of the pandemic preparedness and the response? And that's the first question we are going to dive into a little bit further now in our first deep dive, as I name it, uh, with a keynote address concerning the challenges in pandemic pre preparedness and response. And with us is the EU Chief Scientific Advisor Epidemics and the Professor of a Global Health and Director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I warmly welcome Professor Dr. Peter Piot here on stage. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Katie. Good morning, everybody, colleagues and friends. And a special thanks to our academy, the Leopoldina, for uh, bring us together and for the leadership in, um, you know, in bringing science uh, into the uh, G7. Um, I'm particularly pleased that uh, what I consider as the two uh, existential issues of our time, pandemics and climate change, are the topics of this session, of course, in addition to war and peace. And um, 
as Gerald said, the, uh, the diagnosis is clear. And what we have to do is also not so complicated in theory. But the reality is that the world is actually not doing enough to both stop climate change and to uh, be ready and manage uh, epidemics. And I'm afraid that, yeah, we'll have to bear with some PowerPoint here. But um, my first um, message is really, and it's a sobering reality, is that uh, the pandemic, COVID, is not over. Not over by uh, any means. And it's actually, um, let me see how this works. Um, yeah. And it's actually highly unlikely that we will get rid of this virus. Let's not forget that uh, only one virus that has been eradicated, meaning it's gone out of nature, and that is smallpox virus. But as we also know, there's some family members and cousin that has uh, popped up now with uh, monkeypox, which has, by the way, nothing to do with monkeys. It's very unfair to the monkey. Um, the epidemic, we all know, and uh, I assume that nearly everybody knows someone who has died and uh, who's suffering. Um, but it's still, I think, very and highly underappreciated. The economic, the social impact, the mental health impact, but even mortality. Uh, and it's actually The Economist, Financial Times, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, who challenged the official data coming and the official data from uh, you know, WHO through the ministries of health. And, um, and here you see that uh, instead of the official data of about five, six million people who died, in the reality is more sobering. Something between 15 million and 24. Um, WHO has now also come out with the 15 million. And you can see that the burden has been very unequal uh, across the world. And even here, I should say that for much of Africa, it's probably an underestimate because some uh, more in depth studies have shown that, for example, in a country like Zambia, that the, uh, during a certain period, the overwhelming majority of uh, deaths as identified in the mortuary of uh, Lusaka were actually due to, um, to COVID-19. And when you look at, uh, since we're about G7 here, uh, when you look at G7 countries, also there is enormous range of excess mortality, because that's probably the best way of looking at it. Um, excess mortality, so in other words, mortality uh, above non-crisis mortality in peacetime, as we tend to say. And um, the outliers are the United States, in a sense, uh, but also Japan. And it's very interesting. Uh, last week, there was an article in Nature um, by Dr. Oshitani Itoshi, um, and who uh, explained that despite having um, about the oldest population in the world, which in other words makes them very vulnerable to mortality from SARS-CoV-2 infection, that uh, Japan has um, had a really um, minimal impact. And that without any lockdown also and by applying the Sanmitsu um, approach. And uh, uh, it's as much a, a matter of discipline and culture and uh, as a very uh, targeted um, approach. This shows in reality that it is possible to limit the damage, but not completely. But also, what is largely still underestimated is so-called long COVID. We know about acute impact deaths and, or asymptomatic infection, something's in between. But it's likely that between 20 and 30 percent of people who had the infection, even mild infection, even younger people, suffer from so-called long COVID. And COVID is not just a lung infection, a respiratory. It's not because the virus is transmitted respiratory that it only affects the lungs. Um, you know, you have brain fog, you have uh, kidney implications, heart, and Frankly, I know what I'm talking about because I had a lot of these things myself uh, about two years ago. 
Um, and this is uh, not only have going to have a major toll on people, we don't know what the long-term health consequences are, but also in economic terms for the workforce and so on. But we're also um, in a much better place than two years ago, largely thanks to vaccination. And we should not ignore the amazing efforts that led to in no time, not only to develop vaccine, new vaccines, but also to vaccinate some countries over 90% of the adult population. That is actually unprecedented in history. And um, even if there's many uh, inequalities, and that's a, probably the biggest difference from the, uh, the last huge acute epidemic, the Spanish flu about 100 years ago. But there's of course also natural immunity, um, cumulatively, and policy experience. Now, Hong Kong is an illustration of what it means when um, what the world would be, what Europe would be without a vaccine, even with the so-called milder Omicron uh, virus uh, infection, because the mortality has been enormous. Um, the, um, you know, compared to, for example, Singapore, uh, which went through a similar phase but had very high um, immunization rates, about only 6% unvaccinated, in Hong Kong, 66% of over 80s are unvaccinated. Results, images that such uh, we've seen in Europe, like in Northern Italy, uh, about two years ago around this time. Um, and so I think that the uh, key uh, issue at the moment is that it would be a grave mistake to dismantle all the measures and all the institutions and systems that we've set up um, to deal with this epidemic, because it's highly likely that when the autumn and winter comes, that we will see a surge, and then we will have to start up again. You don't close down the um, fire brigade after a house is burned out and that, uh, you know, and uh, the fire is gone. No, you keep it. Now, when you look at the uh, bit of context here, epidemics are absolutely part of the human condition. We should recognize that. Um, in our 21st and 20th century, we like to think that we are in a risk-free environment, and we are not. Climate change is certainly going to be really hugely, uh, you know, affecting us with extreme weather events, etc. And in fact, on we talk about food security, we're only at the beginning of the problems. Um, but also, when you look at the, uh, this kind of uh, graveyard. Um, selected since uh, the last you know, 100 years ago, more or less, with the Spanish flu. Um, the biggest ones were the Spanish flu, HIV, which has killed cumulatively about 35 million people. We tend to forget that, but came out also as a new uh, emerging infection. And now we have um, you know, COVID. And also, we have regularly these influenza epidemics. And by the way, we are now uh, operating largely in an immunological vacuum, so that means that it's kind of you don't, hard to predict the future, but um, is it this winter or next winter? We'll have a big uh, influenza epidemic, and it could be a perfect storm. Now, um, what do they have in common, all these emerging infections and uh, epidemics? They are basically nearly all zoonosis. In other words, these are viruses, sometimes bacteria, that are coming from other animals than the human you know, homo sapiens, and then crossover, uh, you know, from HIV coming from chimpanzees, uh, Ebola, uh, bats, and bats are one of our favorite animals now, um, influenza, a whole range of animals that are reservoirs. Um, and it's likely that, as Tony Fauci has characterized it, uh, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, that um, we are entering the age of pandemics. There is clearly an acceleration of the occurrence of not only pandemics, but certainly local epidemics and outbreaks. And uh, to be frank, we cannot prevent that an outbreak occurs, that there is a spillover of a virus from one animal to another and sometimes to us humans happens. But what we have to concentrate on is that these emerge into epidemics or uh, even pandemics. But we are in a world now where everything is synergistic to create more epidemics. And I won't go into uh, 
much detail here, but the, you know, when you think of um, when the Spanish flu hit the world, this planet, we were 1.7 billion people. Today, you know where we are, and uh, we're going up soon to 10 billion. Um, urbanization, international travel, everything goes. What used to be a local problem, fast can become a, uh, you know, a, a global problem. Come back to climate change, conflict, poverty, deforestation, uh, biodiversity going down, and food demand and the food a chain. And when it comes to uh, climate change, the most obvious thing we think of is that, okay, we'll have mosquitoes all, all over and they will transmit, let's say, dengue. We had already dengue and chikungunya at the Côte d'Azur and in, in Italy, things that are so-called tropical diseases, but that's a concept that we should put aside that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but in addition, there was an, an interesting paper in Nature, um, I think two or three weeks ago, from uh, Georgetown University, where they modeled long term, always risky, but certainly very powerful, the uh, risk of um, what we could call interspecies uh, spillover, uh, so uh, between various species and as a result of climate change. And one uh, main reason is that because of climate change, animals will move to uh, places that are better adapted to their needs and their habitat. And therefore, there will be concentrations and closer exposure and uh, more, inter uh, more interaction. And then also, um, we will see um, at the end, uh, even if it's rare, more spillovers to humans and the beginning of new epidemics. And the, uh, the, the areas, the regions in the world where this is most likely to occur, according to that study, would be Southeast Asia, parts of Central uh, Africa, but no country is uh, spared. A new virus can emerge here in Berlin. Variants have occurred, you know, in England, in South Africa, in Brazil, uh, anywhere. And, uh, and that's also something that we should keep in mind, that global health is not about something far away. It's here and there. It's all coming together. The, um, and that doesn't necessarily lead to global uh, pandemics, you know, by definition, the whole world. But we've seen it with Ebola, and um, where in the beginning, so I was, when I was a part of the team that isolated the Ebola virus in 1976, um, afterwards, all the outbreaks were in Central Africa, and the dogma was this is Central African thing. But then in 2014, we had the largest epidemic ever uh, in West Africa, affecting three uh, countries, killing 11,000 people in you know, West Africa because there is a, an issue with the habitat and we don't really fully understand that. I'm never, I've never been concerned about a huge uh, pandemic of Ebola because it requires very close contact, just as we see now with uh, monkeypox. But it just illustrates that we should not take anything for granted and that anything can happen uh, at any time. Now, what's the future? And um, I am sorry I forgot my crystal ball at home, but um, it is, there are certain things that are uh, pretty clear and others that will depend on a number of things. And the first one that is the biggest unknown is the evolution of the virus. Although what we know is that this virus um, has a great ability to mutate. It's an RNA virus, it's pretty unstable, and um, we will see uh, more and more uh, mutants. And the question is, will this be very nasty mutants in terms of both being highly transmissible, highly pathogenic, or will there be other features? And not every mutation is a problem for us. Actually, a lot of mutations are a problem for the virus because it can't replicate. But I'll come back to that. It's the duration of uh, immunity, both natural immunity and, um, you know, and vaccine-induced immunity. And that, in general, for respiratory infections is not that great. This is a general rule, but we don't know. Uh, so the effectiveness of the vaccines we have, vaccine coverage and acceptance. A vaccine doesn't work if you don't take it. And, uh, you know, public health and societal measures. And, of course, this is a global issue. We need a global response. Just one comment about the, um, the virus, and this is already incomplete. And this is from studies at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. And uh, we've seen, everybody knows, knows that there are variants in viruses. And, um, but you see what happened uh, about um, yeah, 10 months or so ago 
is that there was a, quite a aberrant variant that popped up in so-called Omicron, and uh, which is kind of evolving into a kind of separate, you can call it zero type or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, we have BA1, BA2 that have really caused the epidemics here in Europe, BA3, but now we have BA4, BA5, uh, BA2, 12, 2, uh, 1 uh, in, is dominant now in the US. And uh, the problem is that uh, this is a, not only that they're more transmissible than the classic ones, but also that uh, there is um, well reduced uh, cross immunity from both natural infection and from vaccine um, induced immunity. And, um, and that means that you can be infected with uh, three variants of Omicron. And, um, we, we have to be mindful when we think of the strategies, which vaccines to use for the next winter. If you're just uh, going to protect against one Omicron uh, type, it's not going to be very helpful. Um, the vaccination, there's huge inequity in the world. I think that this epidemic has shown uh, inequalities ex exacerbated within countries, among countries, um, you know, and there are many studies now that show that it's always the, the most vulnerable, the most, uh, you know, who are the less wealthy and so on that are the most affected by whatever happens. It will be true for climate change as well. And um, here you see, this is the latest uh, update from, um, you know, the uh, tracking of uh, global vaccination. And uh, you see the huge differences in vaccination rates among the world. And in the early days, this was scarcity of vaccines, and scarcity is a big enemy of equity, with uh, uh, you know, the wealthier countries having access to it. Today, there's actually enough supply. That's not the issue. There are many other uh, factors, but also there is some kind of fatigue. There is also something that we should not underestimate, and that is uh, vaccine hesitancy. But there have been already uh, two years ago, before we actually knew that a vaccine would be possible and effective, um, there were some initiatives that were created. One was the ACT Accelerator, uh, initiated uh, by uh, a combination of countries, led in these days by the uh, EU, the Europe, and uh, Germany um, was, a, was a, a dominant, a predominant player in this. We have um, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, was created after the Ebola uh, epidemic because uh, it was clear that where there is no market incentive, companies will not invest in the development of vaccines against diseases such as Ebola and so on. So that's what, why it was created and it came on time. Um, I was a founding uh, board member and uh, we already issued the first uh, contracts of vaccine development. Uh, this was during the World Economic Forum in Davos in um, 2020, uh, in around the 20th of uh, January 2020, when it was not that clear that it would be such a big issue. We have COVAX also, uh, you know, a, a, a new initiative that is, was meant to uh, provide vaccines to, um, yeah, to least uh, developed countries. Um, the strategy was based on um, Indian companies providing vaccines, but then when India was hit by uh, a huge uh, epidemic, um, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, banned export of vaccines, and of course he's elected by Indians and not by, uh, you know, by people from other countries. And that really um, showed also the vulnerability of the world in terms of supplies when you have single providers. One of the silver linings for me of uh, this epidemic is that, for example, that the African Union has really stood up to the challenge and has not waited for charity coming from elsewhere to uh, negotiate vaccines, uh, to organize uh, all kinds of initiatives, and uh, it, it shows how a crisis can strengthen, um, you, know, uh, you know, institutions and, 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 in this case, continents. Now, one question that we're all struggling with is that why all these differences? Why did country X do better than the other one? The first answer I should say is that let's also take some time. Some countries did very well in the beginning and then not so well afterwards and the other way around. So we'll need a bit of a longer term perspective. Um, 
And uh, this is an analysis of the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. And this showed that um, the key issue, um, as they could measure, is, you know, uh, is trust, basically. Uh, trust in government and interpersonal cost. Uh, trust, uh, in, in, uh, that is a real major uh, predictor. There were indices of pandemic preparedness. They put at first the countries that have some of the highest mortality and they're totally useless, that's now clear. Uh, so we need to revise what does it mean to be prepared because there's one thing to be prepared, the other one is to be ready. Um, and um, so there are other indices that didn't work, but trust and uh, let's say the culture of trust and in government is really uh, one of the key elements. And we've seen that. We've seen um, populist reactions, also people who are worried. Um, we, in some countries, this has become a, a classic political issue and divide. In others, it's uh, new populist movements. And I think this is also something where we should keep in mind when we're dealing with climate change and the actions of climate change. This is a, going to be, like, in a sense, a rehearsal, a short-term rehearsal of the behavior change, the changes in society, that will be required to stop climate change because that will be a far longer type of effort and also affecting people's lives. Uh, you know, think of the Gilets Jaunes in France and so on. What, that was an, uh, you know, a movement started with climate change and measures by President Macron. So we've seen uh, major issues. And uh, the um, vaccine uh, confidence uh, project at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, University of Antwerp, they've been measuring way before COVID existed, um, vaccine confidence, vaccine acceptance, and so on. And the vaccine community I mean, they didn't take it seriously until um, the, you know, the problems really became very acute uh, when it came to, um, to COVID. And here, this is just for the European Union, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is from surveys, but it's also translated in actual vaccination coverage and acceptance, where you see enormous discrepancies across the European Union. And it is reflected in the fact that, particularly in uh, Eastern Europe, that vaccination levels are much lower than in uh, the rest of the continent. And that's translated then when you look at the mortality rates. Uh, it's not just a theoretical academic thing. It really um, is about people's lives. So we need to really uh, take this seriously. So where are we, what are, uh, you know, scenarios? This is uh, already, is an article that's uh, nearly, well, it's from 2020, but there's nothing better in a sense, um, because the, the most likely scenario is going to be a bumpy road. Um, and then depending on um, the virus, as I said, mutations, but also vaccination rates, et cetera, and whether people are applying with it, government leadership, and we will see something like that that may look more like uh, influenza every year. So it is about um, living smartly with the virus, in a sense. Uh, that doesn't mean that you accept everything, but just we need to make sure that we can live with it uh, in a way that is economically and personally uh, feasible. Now, there's been a small epidemic of all kinds of initiatives, lessons learned and all that. Um, and uh, I think they're, they're, they're really important. And of course, the, um, you know, what we uh, see here, the, the G7 um, and GS uh, statements are really um, a great contribution. And I think that this is what we need for our leaders to take on. Um, and, um, and as uh, Gerald Haug uh, summarized, it said, no, it's not that complicated. In addition, there are multiple national initiatives. I could make like, I could three, four slides eh, with this. And I think a key is now going to make sure that these uh, initiatives are going to be synergistic, complementary, and working together. Uh, here in Berlin, since we're here, the WHO and the German government uh, launched in September the uh, Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, which is key. You need to know and as soon as possible. And that's also one of the key recommendations of the, um, the plan of uh, the, uh, the G7 pact. But G20, very important also, African Union, as I mentioned, etc. So there are many uh, initiatives that are uh, going on. And uh, I, I think that we need to make sure that, as I said, that they're coming together. Now, 
to end a few, uh, it's a bit boring, but uh, some more of the same, what we have to do. Um, this is, uh, as I said, early detection, uh, surveillance under One Health. Uh, again, it's a, um, one of the recommendations of the Science 7 uh, dialogue, and I really recommend to read it into detail, not only about zoonotic diseases, but also a silent epidemic that may explode one day in our face, and that's antimicrobial resistance where it's so important that we work together with our colleagues. I'm from the human health side, but from the animal health side and agriculture, I should say. Um, but if we have the information and we don't share the data, then it's pretty useless. The good news is, I think, that during this epidemic, there's been good uh, sharing of information. One of the challenges that uh, those of us who work on it is just the avalanche of information, how to manage it. But it's better to have. And it's better than anything that I've seen in uh, my lifetime. Now, we need also, um, you know, public health systems and institutions. Here in Germany, we have the Robert Koch Institute, which is a prime example and historically also one of the leaders in the, the world. That's the kind of institutions that we need, not only actually for pandemic preparedness, but for many other issues, and on the veterinary side, on the animal side as well. Um, but it means also investing in the workforce, one of the recommendations of the uh, uh, G7. And um, in terms of uh, vaccination, we're not there yet. We have fantastic vaccines. It made a huge difference, particularly to prevent severe disease and uh, deaths. But um, we need um, better vaccines that give longer lasting immunity, cross-reacting against all the variants, also, we need to tackle an issue that is not proper to uh, COVID, but that is that of senescence. In other words, with older people, vaccines don't work as well. So we need to tackle that. That will require quite a lot of basic research also, um, because it's predictable that in the future, as we are all getting older, hopefully, uh, that vaccines will play a more and more important role in the elderly, just as they've been playing in the, um, you know, for, um, for younger people. And um, I was very happy to see that the, there's a statement by the um, S7 about the need for antivirals. So products that are there not only to treat an infection, so antiviral drugs, but also can be used prophylactically and particularly for the most vulnerable people are immunocompromised, who the, the very old elderly where vaccines may be less effective, that we need them. And so that requires a, a very joint effort. And there are several initiatives from NIH, the Gates Foundation, Novo Nordics, the um, Wellcome Trust, and so on. Um, and then, of course, this is where the, the R&D. Now, um, in the, uh, at the European level, since I'm the um, special advisor to the President of the European Commission, um, we've been working very hard on because the EU had no legal competency in terms of health. And I think in terms of health care, I totally agree with that. It wouldn't make sense. This is better than history. Yesterday we visited the Reichstag and there was a, a very interesting poster about, uh, you know, the foundation of the security system going back to, to Bismarck. And uh, you don't want to touch on these things country by country. However, when it comes to pandemics and so on, viruses don't know borders and we need instruments. So we uh, created the uh, HERA. Uh, it's the Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority named after the wife of Zeus. And uh, it is, uh, you know, going, means that we have now an instrument at European level, but it can only work if it's embedded in national initiatives, which many countries have now um, uh, in the EU, but also outside, like Japan has launched SCARPA, uh, Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, there are a few things where we need to uh, be more creative and, innate and innovative and get out of this cycle of panic and neglect. When there is a few cases of, let's say, something, and then panic, and then we're going to do all kinds of things, and then it's no longer headline news or something, and then we just go back to normal and dismantle what we have. Uh, this is a, a statement from Janet Yeller, the, uh, you know, from the US, the, uh, from the, um, you know, the Treasury uh, Secretary. And I found a very interesting concept by a, a political scientist from uh, Singapore, Lim Yong Chin, uh, who calls that we have to work now in a VUCA world. And VUCA stands for volatility, 
uncertainty, complexity, and uh, ambiguity. And, and this is the big issue for science advice, that science doesn't always provide the uh, very concrete answers. Um, and so we need to make sure that we maintain this on the top political and science agendas. Without that, it's not uh, going to uh, work. Um, supply of essential tools, and that means today, uh, even if commercially it may not always make total sense, is that we have regional manufacturing. That's why I'm so committed and, uh, and active in ensuring uh, vaccine manufacturing in Africa. The EU has allocated over a billion. Germany is very active in this also. And uh, uh, that for the future, each region will have to make sure that there's something like security uh, for that, not just for COVID, but elsewhere. Um, stronger global and regional institutions and financing. We have the uh, initiative now also at global level of the um, the uh, Financial Intermediary Fund that Germany has uh, been supportive together with uh, the US and the uh, European Union. And um, I would say, above all, investing in public trust, resilience and misinformation. And it means also that we have to, as scientists, we have to be a bit humble, a bit more humble. Because uh, the situation changes, we have to recognize what we don't know. We have to adapt, uh, you know, uh, to our policies. Uh, that's more of a political decision, but uh, you can't continue to be, uh, you know, go for zero COVID when, the, when there's Omicron. It just doesn't work. Look at China. Um, so we need to, uh, this greater adaptability. But the risk is then that people say they have no clue what they're doing. And uh, so you, you undermine the risk. So this is uh, some of the challenges. So let me conclude um, that, um, as I said, it's not over. And let's stop. Uh, with saying like, oh, we can go back to normal. In the best case, we will go forward to a new normal. Um, let's stop by saying an exit strategy because there's no real exit. It's unless you can say stop the world, I want to off it. Um, as I said, we need to think through living smartly with the virus. Um, and there will be other uh, epidemics, that's for sure. Um, the, 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 we're all waiting for the next uh, influenza pandemic. And we basically know what to do, but we can only prepare for what we know. But there are kind of uh, good lessons that we can learn. But the real question is, just as a climate change, will the world do better? Will the world stand up? And this is why science needs to meet politics and uh, ensure implementation. Um, we've seen that just preparedness plans are not enough, that we need institutions, that we need the workforce, that's in, that's in the G7 pact, that we need to manage many crises at the same time, we need a fiscal pace and so on, all the things you need. But what I also uh, am more and more um, working on is that we need to team up those working on climate change and on pandemics. And I think we need to go beyond One Health. One Health is not enough. I talk about planetary health. It is it's humans, we're going to Anthropocene, according to some, but the humans, the other animals, the environment, because it's all together. If we only get, if we miss one of these three, we all will suffer. And that's um, one of the reasons, like at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, we founded a center on planetary health. And in the beginning, people say, oh, what is this? And the next thing is interstellar health. No, no, this is about our survival. So let me conclude that the, the leadership of the G7, the G20, regional entities, uh, will be essential, but we need to go beyond that. G7 represents only one part of the world. G20, only one part of the world. And as Minister Schmidt said, we need to make sure that we, uh, you know, are connected to the countries that are, in essence, suffering the most, but are often um, excluded from the dialogue. And of course, also um, with uh, civil society and have the people with us. Um, so we have, I think we have everything what we need to do. Um, but let's now um, make sure that uh, we do everything we can to implement. No time to lose. This is the ad. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Piot. Thank you very much.
for your insights. I see you in a minute on stage. But before that, we hand over to Professor Dr. Thomas Stocker, who is with us. He's a professor of climate and environmental physics at the University of Bern. And we're going to dive into the topic of confronting now the climate crisis. What's the time for leadership now to combine our health topic with the climate crisis topic? Mr. Stocker, thanks for being here today. Stage is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we're living in a time of unprecedented crises which threaten and destroy livelihoods around the world. The terrible war launched by the brutal attack of Russia on the Ukraine. The COVID-19 crisis caused by negligence and irresponsibility in the way how man handles animals. And the climate crisis caused by our generation and the way we squander resources. These are all anthropogenic crises. For all these crises, man is responsible, and therefore the key to end these crises lies in our hands. Human influence on the climate system is clear. This was one of the short and understandable headline messages that the scientists proposed to the delegates of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the approval plenary in September 2013. This statement set the record straight after years of counterfactual information by climate change deniers who aimed at discrediting and intimidating colleagues around the world to put doubt on the science and derail the international efforts to confront the climate crisis. This headline statement was approved in consensus by all governments who acknowledged that humans are responsible for the unequivocal warming observed during the last 50 years. The authors of that assessment also made the following statement in their draft of the summary for policymakers. Limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. Some have accused us that this statement is policy prescriptive and hence an inappropriate interference of the science with the policy making. In short, we were suspected climate activists. Of course, this was a rather cheap deflection of the conversation. Instead, the purpose of this statement of fact was to directly inform policymakers and the public without jargon, without caveats, about the simple facts of science. Limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reduction in greenhouse gas emission. This is a statement that remains as important and urgent today as it was nine years ago. These two affirmations, based on rigorous research and robust understanding, approved in consensus by all governments of the world and echoed by the media thousands of times, finally laid the solid scientific basis for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to move forward and finalize the Paris Agreement in December 2015. The Paris Agreement was a historical milestone that we can all be proud of. It was reached after more than 20 years of negotiations. The goal to keep global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial temperatures and the declared ambition to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius generated justified hope that finally burning fossil fuels, a technology that is more than 100 years old, that has been very successful, but that has increasingly unacceptable side effects putting humans and nature at grave risk, would be phased out by the mid of the 21st century. 
The Paris Agreement generated hope that mankind would be able, probably for the first time, to take decisions and actions to safeguard the existence of our life-supporting system, our planet. Today, seven years later, the atmospheric concentration of the most important greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, is higher than ever in human history, and it continues to rise. This is because we still have not bent the curve on CO2 emissions. This is because we still produce food without considering the greenhouse gas footprint. This is because we still cut the rainforest, thereby emitting large quantities of carbon dioxide and destroying biodiversity. In short, the message of successive scientific assessments by the IPCC since 1990 and the evidence of rapidly changing climate conditions around the world have not yet led to hard policy decisions and actions. As a scientist, I tend to be impatient, but I do appreciate that things have changed. The conversation is different from 30 years ago. Anthropogenic climate change is a fact, and the loud voices of climate deniers have subsided. But have they disappeared? Has the lobbying to continue to subsidize fossil fuels and using the atmosphere as a waste dump for our carbon dioxide, notably at no charge, really stopped? No. The sixth assessment report of the IPCC published last year has described the climate crisis in unprecedented detail. The concentration of greenhouse gases is now higher than ever in the last two million years. The temperatures around the globe are the highest in the last 2,000 years, in particular in polar areas. Extreme events such as heat waves and wildfires have increased in intensity and frequency and now affect all regions of the world. Sea level rise has become life-threatening in island states and low-lying countries. The melting of glaciers degrades water resources on which millions of people depend. The mass loss of Greenland and Antarctica has accelerated and is approaching tipping points. The ocean acidifies and marine ecosystems have increasing difficulties to adapt to multiple anthropogenic stressors. If this catalog is a metric for the success of lobby organizations, then it is clear that the fossil fuel industry and the chain of industries whose products depend on them simply operate in a more subtle way, more sophisticated, more effectively. After all, the sales of SUV vehicles are on the rise worldwide. Overpowered engines are regular guests in advertisements in all media channels and intercontinental leisure travel is picking up fast after a temporary lull due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we need to be honest. It's ultimately the consumer of fossil fuel, all of us, who have failed in confronting the climate crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, we therefore must ask the inconvenient question whether the science-based goals that were formulated seven years ago and laid down in the Paris Agreement are still within our reach. Before responding to this question, let us recall one of the most contested but finally approved concepts in the IPCC's fifth assessment report, the global carbon budget. It is a scientific fact that global mean warming is proportional to the total amount of carbon emitted by anthropogenic sources since the Industrial Revolution. In short, the more we emit, the warmer it gets. Or, every kilogram of CO2 emitted today will contribute to increase the planet's temperature for thousands of years. The policy relevant of the global carbon budget is immediately evident. Any temperature target, be it 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius, or targets beyond the Paris Agreement, 2.5 or 3 degrees Celsius, 
can be directly converted into tons of carbon. Since we know how much we have emitted until today, emissions that accumulated in the atmosphere, the ocean and the biosphere, we can quickly determine the remaining carbon budget. It turns out that fossil fuel hungry humanity has almost exhausted the remaining budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius. In fact, if we ignore the cooling effect of aerosols that are also emitted during the burning process, we have already today reached the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. This cooling effect of aerosols will be eliminated before long, since people around the world, primarily children and elderly, suffer from respi respiratory re diseases and other health problems caused by high aerosol loads in the atmosphere. Naturally, there are uncertainties in the remaining carbon budget, and a precise year when the budget uh, for this more ambitious target of the Am Paris Agreement will be lost cannot be determined. But we do know that politically agreed climate targets to safeguard humans and ecosystems can be missed. More importantly, they can be lost forever. This is the dire consequence of two realities. The longevity of the heat-trapping carbon dioxide molecule in the atmosphere and our deep-rooted dependence on coal, oil and gas. If science has long informed about the climate crisis in increasing detail and accuracy, we'd have better listen to what science tells us today. First, science tells us that based on the carbon budget, that the historical responsibility for anthropogenic climate change can be quantified. For example, the G7 countries alone account for 30% of the global cumulative emissions since 1850. Second, science tells us that every ton of carbon dioxide emitted from now on counts, no matter how, where, and by whom emitted. This means that increasingly there is a shared responsibility for the loss and damage that is caused by climate change. Third, science tells us that rapid action is indispensable if less ambitious climate targets, such as the two-degree target, should not also be lost. Calculations show that with every decade of inaction, we will lose about 0.4 degrees Celsius climate target. This means that by around 2035, the climate target of two degrees will have become as unachievable as the 1.5 degree target today. With every year of talking about re emission reductions but not acting, our options to confront the climate crisis diminish and our chances to avoid the worst damages fade away. In such a situation of crisis, ladies and gentlemen, leadership is demanded. Leadership in recognizing and communicating the growing risk of losing climate targets. Talking about failure in climate policy has been a taboo for too long. Yes, climate targets are lost by inaction. There are no readily available remedies and fixes, such as, for example, scrubbing out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at global scale, or sprinkling sulfate aerosol particles into the lower stratosphere to cool the planet. Leadership to achieve climate compatibility of every human activity must become good practice in policymaking at the local, regional and national levels. Leadership is demanded to seize the economic opportunities that offer themselves in this great transformation of eliminating fossil fuels and replacing them by new renewable energies. This task has the dimension of an industrial revolution. After mechanization, electrification and digitalization, this will be the fourth industrial revolution. 
It is called decarbonization. As every industrial revolution before, it will generate new jobs, new professions, new products, and new values for society. The partner countries of G7 must play a pivotal role in leading this process and be the champions of the fourth industrial revolution. They have the political power, they have the democratic structures and instruments, and most importantly, they have the financial basis to assume this leadership. The G7 countries are responsible for about 30% of the world's emissions of carbon dioxide, as I've mentioned before. But at the same time, they also share about 30% of all countries' gross domestic product. This is a gigantic financial and political power that could be applied to address the climate crisis. The intellectual power and innovative spirit in all countries I have not even mentioned here. The G7 partner countries are in an excellent position to take leadership in decarbonizing the world because they dispose of an excellent scientific basis. Leadership is particularly powerful when it is based on the combination of democracy, science and innovation. Excuse me. These are all characteristics of the G7 countries, but so far we have not capitalized on these outstanding assets to confront the climate change. It is now high time to do this, move forward and lead the way, lest we lose the climate targets that have been declared in the Paris Agreement. I see seven priorities in closing. First, put a price on carbon emission, recognizing that the polluter must pay the bill. Second, install laws and regulations to avoid squandering of resources and free riding. Three, cut the consumption spiral by stopping obsolescence and promoting reusage. Four, accelerate invention and development of new products for climate action. Five, replace and renew infrastructure and buildings to make them fit for the post-fossil fuel era. Six, invest in the education of the next generation of scientists, engineers, policymakers, and citizens. And finally, seven, listen to the science. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your contribution to face this challenge and act. Thank you. Please stay on stage with us. And Professor Pierre, would you join us on stage? Watch out to step. Before we head into lunch break, I know I'm between you and your lunch. <laughs> it's always a very difficult task. We'd just like to use the past 20 minutes uh, to pick up on a few points that were just raised. Um, Mr. Professor Stocker, you were talking and raising up the keyword of leadership. And I think this is interesting to go a little bit deeper into it. Maybe you can share with us any good examples of leadership that you observe. Well, unfortunately, I have to go outside Switzerland because last June, uh, to my embarrassment, Switzerland has uh, voted against uh, a CO2 law and regulations that would bring us one step further towards uh, 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 achieving the Paris uh, Agreement uh, goals, uh, which we have committed to as uh, uh, the Swiss uh, country. Good examples, I see lots of young people in my environment uh, who personally take action, who go to the streets, who change their lifestyles, who try very hard to uh, confront the climate crisis through changing their carbon footprint. I think that's a very good sign that from below there is action. In fact, there is political action, if you think of Fridays for the Future, that was 
absolutely surprising. Uh, I remember scientists have been warning about uh, the global warming since uh, the mid-70s. The science was understood, but the voices were not heard or they were overprinted with uh, counterfactual information. Once the message came from the street, this was so surprising that uh, policymakers actually listened. And I think that was a very good example of a two-pronged approach because the movement could not make the argument had the science not done the homework before. So it's actually quite a, a nice synergy, an example of synergy, how one can start on a way to change society. Professor Piot, would you agree when we talk about leadership? May I quote you, you said the most important qualities are having, of course, a good leadership institutions that detect viruses early when we talk about pandemic preparedness, but leadership also in the both nexus is climate and health are important. So what's, what's a good leadership for you? Yeah, I think that uh, I, I totally agree with what Thomas said in the sense that um, without the leadership, we can have the, um, all the science we want and, and the evidence, but if it's well, first of all, if we're not able, we scientists, to explain it in, you know, in an understandable language, that's a problem sometimes also. But that leadership is required. And the reason that it's so important is that you often have to go against the immediate, um, what people perceive, me, myself, and I, freedom. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's not easy. So that's, and that is very uh, challenging in, uh, in, when we have politics that are driven by opinion polls and by the short term. But I think on the epidemic we've seen uh, strong leadership, I think, in some countries. And it's very interesting, I mentioned the, the African Union, okay, um, that uh, I always say let's make use uh, of a crisis, never miss a good crisis. And uh, climate change, the problem is the crisis has been going on for so long and there is still the perception that this is something for on the long term. And uh, that's not true. But African Union has really come together and they, for example, uh, created now an autonomous centers for disease control. Uh, before it was a department in the African Union with all the bureaucratic problems and so on. And, and they've started uh, not, you know, negotiating themselves and so on. I think also in Europe, it has brought countries together with uh, quite strong leadership of uh, Ursula von der Leyen. That's uh, at that political level. But then uh, I think it is at the community level. You, leadership is not just something for above, for the chancellor or the president or whatever, but it's at all levels. And it's in the company, it's in an institution. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm very concerned about the fact that often the leadership at a popular level has been on the anti-front and when you see climate denialists and vaccine denialists and anti-vaxxers and people who deny about the epidemic they're often the same individuals and certainly in the same movements and um, we've actually up to now i think failed to counter that and often as scientists we say kind of they don't know what they're talking about they're stupid they we need give them more information that's i think missing the point it is about, often about many other things. And so we need to develop, let's say, the science of understanding this climate denialist and, and all this where the leadership is, is also real. Eh? You've got good leadership and bad leadership. We need good leadership. Um, so it's, but without it, I, I don't see it happen. But it's not, it's someone, uh, you know, you said it also, consumers or it's all of us need to show leadership in wherever we do mm. and that is not only true for these two issues i think there's one point that we tackle on in a minute is communication i think that's an interesting point but before that i'd like to ask you how do you look back to the past two years um you know as a european advisor uh, or advisor for the european union the eu chief scientific advisor for epidemics what was a good leadership and what was maybe a lesson learned well, I think crises uh, such as a pandemic bring out the best and the worst in people. Can uh, you tell us both? <laughs> well, yeah, when you look at the, um, the dedication of the, uh, you know, healthcare workers, people in communities, care homes and so on, who worked literally day and night, 
uh, often at pretty low salaries and not always recognized. Um, I mean, is that leadership or not? But that's certainly dedication and all that. And I think that's something that uh, it shows that without that the community uh, engagement, we can't make it. Um, and in the beginning in the EU, it was the, the response was, um, how to say, balkanized, to use that term, but this was erratic. Uh, many member states of the EU, they closed their borders, even to export diagnostic tests, even protective material. And that was within a month or so, was, was solved. And I, it's not because I'm her advisor, but I think so von der Leyen really played a, a major role there and said, okay, this is absolutely not acceptable. And, and then reason prevailed to a certain extent. Uh, so that's, that is possible. Also, a joint procurement of vaccines, because only, okay, Germany is a big market and so on, but if you're a small country, you're the last in the queue, you know? And so that leadership means also that you ensure equality and equity. Where the world has failed is that, uh, I think, at global level, um, you know, there has not been yet a debate in the Security Council of the UN on COVID or the General Assembly, whereas we organized that more than 20 years ago on AIDS and so on. So I think that uh, there's still a, a need for, uh, for strengthening that. But it's too easy to say, okay, there's need of leadership if we don't take up our responsibility. And the same is true for climate change. But we are not out of the woods, and I'm concerned particularly of um, the next waves that are going to come. Because people are fed up, I understand that. Um, you know, it's more of the same, and you have to... We were probably too optimistic about what vaccines could do. I mean, what they clearly can prevent death, but not infection. So our credibility as scientists is also something that we need to, to think through. And, uh, and I think being transparent and honest is, is key, but then also um, not compromise on, on what the scientific basis of a response and telling the truth even if it's unpleasant. And that's what you've been doing also. Professor Stocker, yeah, you might get the impression that the attention span for climate crisis, also for pandemic preparedness, lose its way because we're used to re re reading all the news. So what is your recommendation that maybe when we talk about pandemic preparedness, it will be faced or it will still stay with the attention that it needs um, because the climate crisis loses its attention? Well, uh, unfortunately, I disagree <laughs> because the climate crisis is present in pulses. It manifests itself through extreme events and we have just come out of 2021, an extraordinary year of a series of extreme events that uh, were not predicted, were not estimated before. I, I just mentioned the wildfires in several places on this planet uh, where whole uh, cities or, or villages have burned down. People had to uh, be displaced. They lost their properties uh, just by the simple fact that the climatic conditions were such that such fires could be triggered. And I think it's these extreme events, not only the fires, but the heat waves that interact directly with the physiology of humans, the most vulnerable people, are a health threat. These extreme events will occur at higher intensity and more frequent. So unfortunately, we are not sort of in a, in a position where we can uh, get used to climate change. In fact, the big question is, whether we will still be able to adapt. And what we certainly know from the science is that beyond the warming of two degrees Celsius, there are indeed regions on this planet where climate adaptation is no longer possible and the consequences can be easily imagined. What do you think, what needs to be more communicated than when we talk about communication, also with the communication with the consumers? We well, I think communication that is carried out by the scientists is just one element of uh, awareness building in a society. 
I've mentioned uh, the youth movement uh, earlier, and I think uh, things like that, where civil society or parts of civil society declare uh, here is a problem and here are solutions and we want to contribute to these solutions is as essential, if not more, than just communicating facts in degrees Celsius, millimeters per year of sea level rise, etc., etc. These numbers are important. We need to continue to observe our planet and how it changes because uh, this is the basis of early warning systems. Uh, not only for extreme events, but also for impending tipping points, for example. But at the same time, I think one needs to build on a, on a, on a, on a movement in society that actually takes that forwards and demands it from the elected political leaders. Yeah, I think that the um, pandemic crisis has propelled scientists to the forefront of communication. And uh, um, last week in Davos, the Edelman presented its annual trust barometer. And uh, um, I can't remember whether it was worldwide or for Europe, but the, um, the type of people that uh, have the highest trust in society were scientists, very interestingly. And I wonder whether that's not something that we could capitalize on then also and that's why I think that joining forces is something we should do. We learned that the hard way. And of course, there are, I mean, the, the hardcore skeptics, we will not convince. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm usually a, an optimist. But uh, this is something where uh, we need to have a deliberate effort. But the fact that that's this trust barometer, politicians will like very low. Uh, interestingly, also the second uh, most trusted group were CEOs of companies, I would, which I would not have guessed. But uh, yeah, so this is a, a huge uh, uh, annual survey that they do at uh, uh, the Edelman Group. So I think we um, we have to um, yeah to to take a cold and hard look. But also we are scientists, so we should take a scientific approach, and that means that we need to understand why people are skeptical or not hearing it or whatever and um, and this is why we need the social sciences in this um, you know i'm a microbiologist and physician my training is not my field but we need to understand that and it's only then i think that we can um, you know tailor made our communication which is probably very different for a 19 year old and for a 70 year old and for wherever you come from. Uh, so, but we need, it needs to be about people because I think that I wonder um, what does it mean? What do people realize, uh, um, imagine 1.5 degree increase in them? I don't think, oh, it's only 1.5. It's not a problem. It's a difference between 19 and a half and 21 degrees in my bed, in my bedroom, something like that. No, so what does it mean for people? And that's where these extreme events, because that's where they feel it. And, that's, and then we have to really demonstrate that that's because of climate change. And but how um, do we speak then the language of the consumers, of the people that we like to address, the well, policy makers? Do we need to learn as scientists a new language? Yeah. I mean, we need to, I, I don't think, I'm not on any social media, but I've turned myself up, I've been on TikTok and on these, all these things, because I, to my surprise, there are people who are, have millions of followers I've never heard of, uh, but they're influencing. Maybe and we can start. TikTok yeah, exactly. Today and exactly. <laughs> and they, they convince people to buy useless things that may even be damaging to their health or to the climate. So we need, that's why I'm saying, Let's take a bit of a yeah. systematic, um, maybe unscientific approach in the science, of, but it's for me the scientific approach, understanding that. And that's a science and that has to be funded also, because it's, uh, you know, any consumer company does that kind of research. We don't do that enough. Professor Stocker, when you communicate, do you communicate via TikTok? 
about the newest <laughs> numbers and news of the IPCC? Or how do you communicate? How do you find the language to address as many people as possible? Well, uh, when I was in charge, that was a couple of years ago. In fact, uh, Twitter was not really a media at the time. And for us, the most important element of good communication at the time was to find simple, understandable wording and sentences. Like human influence on the climate system is clear. Just a little anecdote. Uh, as a scientist, I proposed that to my colleague and they said, ah, oh, you will fail. That's not really reflecting the complexity of the problem that we are confronting with. And so we had a, a good discussion of about half an hour what uh, word should be used in that one sentence. Undisputable, uh, unequivocal, irrevocable, <laughs> etc., etc. And it, I actually gave the word only to the native speakers. And in the end, after 20 minutes, one person said, clear is not such a bad word. Let's stick with it. But after a conversation, and then the policymakers liked it too. And the most interesting element of that conversation was that the sentence was so simple that the media took it over without editing. In other words, we had the voice of the media around the world by offering them a sentence that was fully backed up by complex science that laid in the 1,537 pages of the assessment, but was distilled to the maximum extent into one sentence. That was communication nine years ago. Um, it was fully compatible with the Twitter length of a message, which I didn't know at the time, but uh, it could be repeated, and I think that mechanism now you can transport into social media, only that I don't do social media. I leave that to other people who, uh, who are uh, faster in uh, typing messages on their mobile phones. Thank you, thank you very much. I think this is a good inspiration for our lunch break to talk about communication, to think about communication, how to communicate equivalently to the audience that we want to reach without doubts and you know, with a lot of efforts because filtering and distilling, it's a lot of work to find the sentence coming from a media myself from, as a journalist. It's, it's tough to have this very distilled yeah. sentence in the end. Yeah, but also I think we can work on it. So my daughter works for MTV and they do soap <laughs> operas and so on. And I'm always impressed how much research goes into something that seems to be quite superficial, but they have a target age group and the language and so on. And it's a lot is in Africa and so on. And, and, and how you describe relationships and so on is different in one part of the world and in the other and the terms and terminology and all that. They invest in research and we are kind of as scientists amateurs in this. We, we mean it well, but we need to do I, When I got media training many years ago when I became head of UNAIDS, you know, as a scientist you see what's the problem, what's the methodology, the results, and what, how do you interpret. By that time everybody switched off. They told me, start with a conclusion, with a kind, and I was very resistant to that because it goes against our training. So I think there is, we need people like you, and uh, I mean the whole, um, I would say the science of communication, understanding, and trust but it, it, it requires some investment also. If we invest billions in the whole effort, we can invest a few millions in, you know, in doing a better job. And the openness to communicate. Yes, because it Thank will you. save lives. Thank you very much. This is your round of applause. And I can assure you, we will not start with the conclusion. We will not start with the dessert. We will start with the first course, the salad now, the lunch is over, is uh, ready for you, and we see each other again quarter past one. So a good hour for you now to switch off. Thank you, thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I know the mousse au chocolat was excellent and the food, but let's come back and welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, also who are joining us uh, online. Thanks for joining us in the live stream here for the S7 Dialogue Forum at the Museum for Communication in Berlin. Um, it's great to have you, everybody on board and we are diving into our afternoon which is, of course, also filled with a lot of debates. And I also warmly welcome all of you to share with you your thoughts and your questions. What keeps you busy? Because it's not just about the questions here on stage. It's really a conversation with each other. So please share with us your questions. We do have colleagues with microphones, um, and there will be enough time and space for, for your questions, ladies and gentlemen. We are starting with the afternoon to talk about uh, the increasing pandemic preparedness and the question for the need for a One Health approach. And we're going to dive into the S7 recommendations, followed, as I mentioned, by a discussion and, of course, your questions. And I warmly welcome now, as the first speaker of the afternoon, the director of the Institute of Medical Virology at the University Hospital in Frankfurt. And she's also professor of medical virology at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, Professor Dr. Sandra Zizek. This is your round of applause. Thank you. It's great to have you. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the first recommendations that was written by a, uh, by a group of scientists from all seven countries. And it's for pandemic preparedness and antiviral drugs. The current pandemic has until now resulted in more than 530 million infections and more than 6.3 million deaths worldwide. We've all seen what a huge impact this pandemic has had on all areas of, all, of our life. If an antiviral drug would have been avail available at the beginning of the pandemic, it would have had little impact on the absolute number of infections However, it would have led to significantly fewer deaths and serious illness. Therefore, it must be a goal to have drugs more quickly available, um, but for further uh, pandemics. Antiviral drugs are not only a bridge as long as we don't have vaccines, but we also need them for people who do not respond to vaccination because they are immunosuppressed or um, have cancer, for example. Traditional antiviral drugs are designed for high efficacy against a distinct virus. However, which virus will cause a future pandemic can, cannot be predicted. Therefore, in addition, broad spectrum antiviral drugs are needed for immediate response and pandemic preparedness. Broad spectrum antiviral drugs are directed against not only one specific virus, but an entire virus group or even wider. And in addition, it's important that these drugs are easy to take and safe and that they have a few or even no side effects. And in the best case scenario, new broad spectrum antivirals will be developed to the point where they can be used directly in phase two trials in the event of a new pandemic. To better prepare for the next pandemic with broad spectrum antiviral drugs, we have developed three recommendations. First, foster the discovery and development of specific and broad spectrum antivirals. It's important that research on antiviral drugs is continued and intensified even in times without a pandemic. This requires long-term basic research from both, from academia and industry, and a better coordination between both of them and incentives for industry to invest in the development of antiviral drugs even if it's unclear whether this will ever be of economic benefit for them. In addition, the early detection of viruses that can become pandemic should be improved. Second, we need infrastructures for efficient clinical studies. This includes international coordination to avoid duplication and standardized study protocols and sample collections, as well as the implementation of infrastructures for clinical studies, including in the outpatient setting. In addition, without compromising quality and safety, regulatory reviews should be accelerated. And last but not least, pandemic preparedness is a major task that can only 
be addressed globally and needs international coordination. Therefore, joint funding structures for pandemic preparedness should be established. All people should have access to antiviral drugs, uh, regardless of the country in which they live, and all countries should share their experience in national pandemic action plans. In addition, promotion of international networks which allow the identification of viruses and risk assessment for surveillance in humans and animals is required. And to, uh, yeah, with this, I would like to end and hand over to the next speaker, to Thomas uh, Hedenleiter. Sandra. We're going to join here. Yeah, we stay here and we're listening to Thomas Medenleiter. Thank you also for your insights. Stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to introduce the S7 recommendations on One Health approach to zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance. So, dear presidents and representatives of, of the academies, dear colleagues and friends. First of all, I would like to thank the working group, actually, I mean, who wrote these this, uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, we had a very pleasant and consensual writing meeting in Halle in, in early April. Um, it may sound a little boring, but indeed it was a very pleasant and intensive discussion. So One Health, what does it actually mean? I mean, we heard it a lot also today, um, but I would like to give a definition that actually has been issued by the One Health high-level expert panel uh, late last year, um, and this had been agreed upon by the WHO, OIE, FAO, and UNEP, fortunately nowadays called the Quad Tripartite, so they now indeed work together at equal level. And this definition says, one Health is an integrated, unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystems. It recognizes the health of humans, domestic and wild animals, plants, and the wider environment, including ecosystems, are closely linked and interdependent. The approach mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities at varying levels of society to work together to foster well-being and tackle threats to health and ecosystems while addressing the collective need for clean water, energy and air, safe and nutritious food, taking action on climate change, and contributing to sustainable development. So this is a far-reaching definition of what One Health should actually constitute. And actually, we were quite pleased to see that in the communique of the G7 health ministers meeting um, two weeks ago, um, this particular definition was specifically welcomed. Thus, One Health is a far-reaching concept for health based on the sustainable development goals. Within these broad areas, two major topics dealing with infectious diseases gained prominence in the past years. So not the infections, that is diseases transmitted from animals to humans and the other way, and increasing antimicrobial resistance. 75% of emerging human infectious diseases are zoonotic, like SARS-CoV-2 or like monkeypox, which is not surprising because, I mean, humans are part of the animal kingdom. It sounds trivial, but it's still something that we really have to reflect um, all the time. Antimicrobial resistant microbes can spread between humans, animals, and the environment through, for example, food, water, aerosol, and feces. So the recommendations of the S7 academies this year focus on these two areas and continue a process that has actually been started a while ago and has continuously been followed up through the G20 and G7, notably also last year under the Italian and UK presidencies. It's now also been taken up by the presidency of Indonesia on, in, in the G20. So I think this is a, a massive recommendation um, that we actually give to policymakers. It is under the impression of the devastating SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, but now also highlighted by the emerging monkeypox, uh, monkeypox epidemic, that One Health has gained more attention, and the window of opportunity is still open to take this approach seriously into implementation at global, regional, national, and local levels. 
up. It would be good if I had the slides. Uh, this is not my slide, but it makes a case. Um, it's, it's actually a slide from, from Sandra Zizek from Frankfurt. Uh, that's, that's a, that's, it's monkeypox, actually. But I wanted to have the slides with the recommend, the recommendations. I can press back and forward. OK. They, they are working on it. The recommendations are finished. I mean, you have them in printed versions. We are not still working on them. It's work in progress. You can already think about questions for the panel discussion. OK, then I just continue. Central to the One Health definition are four Cs. And this is cooperation, coordination, communication, and capacity building. Um, this entails sustainability in financing mechanisms. There it is. Now I hopefully press the right button. Yeah. Um, this entails sustainability in financing mechanisms, the creation of a One Health workforce, prudent use of antimicrobial drugs, and investment in One Health systems for early detection and surveillance of pathogen spillovers and AMR. As we now observe with monkeypox, there is still a lot to do. Preparedness towards detection and control requires a significant amount of resources including the use of new digital technologies and artificial intelligence. The establishment of international standards for data format and quality, and what I consider most importantly, to reduce barriers to data exchange at national and international levels. It's frustrating to see what technologies we have available and how little can we actually use in the purpose um, that we are aiming at. It requires infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, education and training, and a rise in awareness. We have to mobilize all players to cooperate. Pharmaceutical industry, public bodies, civil society. But it also requires research into the determinants of health as included in the novel definition. Links between climate change, loss of biodiversity, the importance of food systems, the increase in poverty, now even exacerbated by the Russian attack on the Ukraine, and the increase and spread of zoonotic diseases and AMR. COVID-19 has taught us a clear message, and it was perhaps the last warning shot to mankind. Prevention is a much larger challenge. Prevention requires changing habits and attitudes. In this context, one Health is no longer a concept or an approach, but One Health is a way of living. And it is essential to attain the ultimate goal, One Health for humans, animals, environment, and ecosystems, and the whole planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. Please uh, join us in our panel. And I also warmly welcome Professor Dr. Felix Rai. He's the director of the Virology Department, Institut Pasteur Paris. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Professor Rai, when you look back to your past 24 months, to the past two years, and when we talk about the lessons learned from COVID-19, and also maybe some blind spots when we also debate and discuss about being prepared for the next pandemic, what do you see? I think it's very important. I mean, one of the lessons that we have from this pandemic is the, the fact of... Take your microphone a little bit closer so I can... It, yeah, you. it's no. the, the, the action, for instance, the knowledge that we, knew, well, that we had. So, for instance, we had a vaccine in a remarkable period of 10 months, which was, had never been achieved earlier. So this was a combination, as we know, of the messenger RNAs and the, the lipid, but also of the sequence of the molecule that we put in. So this, the, the spike glycoproteins with specific two problems mutations that made this to be stable and to be the right immunogen. 
And so, and we know that because we had been other experiences like the SARS-1 coronaviruses back in 2003 and then the MERS, and people had been investigating on this. And uh, so, which goes to show that when you know enough on a given viral family, on a given coronavirus, for instance, you can apply. But it so happens that for many other viruses that are around, we don't have that knowledge. And so one of the important things to know is that we, uh, we, we know how many different viral families exist and for which we don't know enough. And so uh, one of the lessons that I see is that we should really do not neglect viruses just because they're not causing uh, diseases at a given time, but uh, have like a broader, uh, I mean, research focus on trying to have at least one exemplary from each of the families that could emerge, and there are many examples like that. And I think this is one of the lessons that we should keep in mind and not go always running after an outbreak. We were lucky this time, uh, despite uh, the problems that we had in the pandemic. Thank you. Professor Cizek, would you say we were lucky with all the lessons that we were learning or that we are still learning? Yes, I, I'm, I, I totally agree with you. And um, so for me, my personal lesson was that it's really important to work together in a crisis and not uh, yeah, each for its own and not only within uh, one discipline like we are all virologists but also with different uh, disciplines but also with the um, policy, with the politics and with the industry we have to work together because when I think back two years the universities had the cell culture systems for SARS-CoV-2 and the industries had the compound libraries to screen um, for antiviral drugs and then they had to work together and can develop faster antiviral drugs which was really nice but there's still an improvement I think because when I um, think back then when industry and university have to work together, we, you always need a contract because it has to be fair for both sides. And that was the problem um, when I remember back because this takes uh, weeks or even months to, to um, have these contracts ready. And I think this is what we can do better the next time that these contracts are ready before we have a next pandemic and before we can start that we can directly start and working together. Professor Mettenleiter, when you think back, what gives you a smile and what gives you a headache? Um, I see a smile, uh, or, or you see a smile, certainly I, I can agree, uh, with the development of uh, vaccines. This was really a blueprint, and this is something where I really think we learned a lot for uh, preparation for the, for the next pandemic, which I'm sure will come. I think, I mean, all the experts will agree. Um, I mean, the other side of the coin definitely is that this intersectoral collaboration, I mean, didn't, didn't work as well as it, as it could. Um, and I sometimes say this SARS-CoV-2 pandemic was a, a, a huge field trial for the real one. And the real one could be something that we virologists could think uh, could be, ex I mean, much worse. I mean, we heard about case fatality rates today already. Uh, I mean, the average case fatality rate that SARS-CoV-2 induces I mean, it's not really exceptional for a pathogenic virus. Um, so I think, I mean, what we need to learn is exactly this intersectoral cooperation. Um, what we need to learn is to use all the competences and capacities that are available. Um, and there is still a, a lot of room for improval. One Health is nice, I mean, but it needs to be lift. It needs to be put on the ground. And this is what we have to work on very quickly because, I mean, as, as I said, monkeypox is already, I mean, uh, showing us that uh, our preparedness is probably not as good as it should be. We will talk about the One Health approach in a minute. Let's skip that for, for a second and let's ask from your perspective, and we talked a lot about, I mean, we don't have um, the future class, you know, in front of us, but from your science, do you expect to have more zoonoses very soon coming up in your, in, or in all of our daily lives in future? Um, and of course, how free or unfree do you see our everyday lives from zoonoses when we think not just, you know, for the next upcoming five years, but also let's think in uh, times of decades or 10 to 20 years. Can you give us an example of what, from your science? I mean, zoonotic infections are an, an, a natural phenomenon. It is, this is biology. This is nothing special. 
Um, as I said, I mean, man is part of the animal kingdom, and so I mean, uh, and, uh, viruses that that jump over species barriers between animals, they also uh, uh, jump species barriers towards humans. Um, so we will never be able to really uh, completely reduce um, these spillover events. Uh, but I think what we actually will see is with the increase in human populations, um, this is a just, I mean, a numbers game. The more humans are on the world, I mean, the more likely they get in touch with, with animals. Uh, animals both in, in, in the terms of wildlife because we intrude into habitats that we didn't do so before. Um, there is, uh, I mean, uh, change in land use. There's deforestation, for example, that plays a role. Um, but there is also a situation that more people need more food. They also want to have more, more food, I mean, animal protein, which means we have more uh, um, uh, livestock. Livestock needs to be fed. There needs to be more, more uh, feed for them as well. And this is kind of a vicious circle that we need to break. Um, because otherwise, indeed, we are, just by the numbers, we are entering in a period where these spillover events will happen more frequently and they will probably and also more frequently de develop in something like starting with lo local epidemics, then uh, some of them expanding in, in, into pandemics. On the other hand, um, I think we are also a lot better in at least in technology-wise, in discovering these spillover events and being able to discover the first development of, of infectious change and uh, chains. And this is something that I still firmly believe in, that we can get significantly better in detection of these early uh, infectious chains, in, in syndromic surveillance. Um, and I think this sh should be a focus um, uh, working on that. But as I said, if you really want to prevent we have to drastically change the way we live. The way we live. And we also talked and listened a lot about AMRs um, in the morning sessions. What do you see? What are the obstacles and also the challenges in your perspective when we have to talk about AMRs also from your perspective, but then of course heading over to Professor Ray? I mean, the challenges in AMR haven't changed. Um, when, when, I, when, when we met here um, in 2017 uh, in, in, under the G20, uh, I mean, One Health was all about AMR and nobody cared about zoonotic infections. Uh, now it's all overshadowed by COVID-19 and now it's all viruses and, and, and zoonosis uh, without having solved the AMR issue, of course, that's still there. Uh, I mean, back then I, I traveled around and said, don't forget zoonotic infections. Now I travel around and, and, and say, don't forget AMR. Um, so basically, this is at the moment a silent pandemic. It will, hopefully, it will not um, develop into a less silent pandemic. But chances are pretty good, and this is why I think we need to really continue the efforts that we started in terms of AMR. Uh, I mean, creation of new um, antibiotic therapies, um, and also this this prudent use. This is also also now. A, Trivial, trivial word, but it's so complicated to get this also down to the ground in the different levels. This is something also which is a one health problem in human medicine, in, in veterinary medicine, and of course everything that's related with the ecosystems as well. Professor Ray, and then I don't forget you, Sandra, I'm coming back to you in a second, but Professor Ray, um, yeah. how do you look on AMRs? And of course these questions that were just raised up when we talk about AMRs and Well, AMR was the, the problem of the way we use antibiotics in industry and in the farm. So there are many things that uh, w we discussed about climate change and things to change. And uh, we, that's another aspect. So uh, the overusing AMRs for different purposes should be controlled. But we don't only have the problem of antimicrobial resistance, we also have the problem of uh, generate a new antimicrobials or antivirals, for instance. And that's another uh, whole issue, and there is a very nice statement that Sandra uh, presented. So these antivirals, uh, th they should be especially possible as broad as they can be. And we know that there are certain metabolic pathways that all viruses use in cells, for instance, for lipid metabolisms and others, which could be tackled, but we need quite a lot of fundamental research to really understand those, and those should be funded. We, we should really, I, I keep insisting on the importance of fundamental research in, in order to, to do this. And the other aspect is that these antivirals will work if you administrate them very early during an infection, because uh, after a few, it, m most of the severe cases of disease is uh, after the virus stops replicating and is the, an overreaction of the immune system. And those are other aspects that really should be known in order to be able to, to uh, have good measures 
in addition to vaccines and everything. Brings us to antivirals. Professor Cizek, how important is this topic to be prepared for an upcoming pandemic when we have to talk about the antiviral drugs and of course the designing of successful antivirals? Yeah. I think it's very important because um, if you look for approved antivirals, there's not much on the market. So I think more than 50% or even 70% are against three classes of viruses or three viruses. It is HIV, HCV and HPV. And there are no, a lot of other viruses where no antiviral target or no antiviral drug exists. and. Um, for preparedness of new pathogens, I think we have at least three candidates um, th that m may cause a pandemic. These are influenza viruses, coronaviruses, and maybe also flabby viruses. And uh, there we have the chance to now develop antivirals, broad spectrum antivirals that not only target one of these um, 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 viruses, for example, SARS CoV 2 but maybe a whole class like the coronavirus family, like the, uh, the, the flavivirus family. And um, at least we have different strategies. I think Felix can also uh, mention this. So you can target the virus directly and conserved um, a region of the virus, for example, an enzyme. Uh, you can target uh, the host because the virus always needs uh, host factors in the cell to replicate. These are essential factors for the virus and if you target the host then um, replication can be blocked and you can target um, or you can activate the immune system with interference for example to make the cell resistant to the infection. These are the three strategies and I think we really need more research on this topic with um, these viruses, even more viruses, but at least these three virus families to be better prepared and uh, to have antivirals ready if a new pandemic um, will start. So two different strategies, um, the direct acting antivirals on the house targeting agents strategies. Maybe we can go to Professor Rai again. What are pros and cons of these strategies? Can you just quickly give us a wrap up? I know normally it takes a, a big scientific paper probably, but no, but what in, are in, the in, a, in a sense, direct acting antivirals is targeting the virus. So I mean, some viral proteins, there are proteases, polymerases, you need to replicate. The caveat is that very often the virus can uh, develop resistance by changing or are specific to one given virus. Whereas uh, the, those targeting the host can be uh, uh, targeting pathways that the virus does not control and is, uh, it's in a cell. But you can do this, for instance, the examples that uh, Sandra just mentioned are all viruses that are chronic. Uh, HIV, you have it in your life, H, uh, hepatitis C, or, so the, it's different when you challenge an acute infection like influenza or coronavirus, in which if, if you give the antiviral very early, uh, it's good. But um, if, uh, but if you were to have uh, compounds that target the cell, they could become toxic in the long run. But here, if you have a very short window in which you can administer that, uh, uh, the, 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 you can come up with something very efficient and, and, and cure people. And if you target, for example, the entry factor of the virus, where the virus enters the cell, then you can even avoid infection if you're lucky. Is that the image that you brought with you? No. Or is that another image? I think it's on the slide, but I think it's not um, so good presented there. All right, so we come into that in a minute. Are there any questions from the audience already? I see one hand, another hand. I see young generations here over there. I have you, yes, I see you. It's, it's great that we have so many generations here, and I think this is important to not just talk about each other, but with each other. So I see two two hands, and we do have um, two colleagues with the microphone. Um, I just kindly ask you not to... Oh, yeah, you have got the, the hook microphone, wonderful. Because we're still living in the um, pandemic times, and I don't want to... Uh, it's coming already. It's, no, uh, all right, so that's... Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Maybe you quickly introduce yourself, and then you have your concrete I'm, uh, question. I'm Ernst Ludwig Winacker, um, actually also a virologist to some extent. Um, but uh, I was also involved in some management activities. <laughs> if you talk about 
One Health. You could be inclined to think of the, of the WHO, for example, of the World Health Organization, because it covers the entire world on one hand, and it also covers different disciplines. Now, in your paper here, do you want to create a new WHO, mm -hmm. an improved WHO, or something entirely new, which is based on lessons learned uh, from the current pandemics? Thank you. Um, that was my question. Thank you. And, and as you know, as you may have heard, I, I realize that there has been some criticism of WHO. We heard that. We take your questions to the panel and I just quickly collect the other question and then we summarize it up. Is that okay? Wonderful. Where is the gentleman with the other question? Ah, Mr. Peart. Yeah, of course. Sorry. I've Microphone is coming. Oh, wow. It's a big one. Uh, thank you. I think this, this is very important. But one thing I, I believe that in the uh, uh, prophylactic use of antivirals is going to be very important, particularly for the elderly, for immunocompromised uh, people uh, where vaccines are actually suboptimal as long as we haven't solved the problem of senescence in vaccination. So that's a kind of I'm missing that in the whole thing because that uh, even for the next wave I see far more applications for that than actual therapy where you have to act so early on that it's often not very practical. So, so it's really important we have better uh, antivirals not only for COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Professor uh, Cizek and Professor Wright, the last question goes clearly, I think, to you, and then we start with One Health. Yeah, I totally agree with you that we need antivirals also for anti-vaxxers that don't want to get the vaccine. That's also a third group. And um, I think we need both, <laughs> not, not only the, the, the vaccine, but also antiviral drugs, yes. Professor Ray, would you add something? No, yes. Okay. Obviously, uh, prophylactic use of antivirals is extremely important, but I just remind that the, it's the requirement for no toxicity at, o toxicity at all. So they have to be, the, we still need to be extremely safe in order to spread use of uh, antivirals like that. So. Yeah, and they and concerning the question, yeah, I can see a planet health. Uh, organization uh, as, a, as an extension of the World Health Organization, which... We're coming to that in a second. Give me uh, one little break <laughs> before I, I, I we go just, into one health. I just <laughs> want to add that they then have to be orally, for example, and not intravenously, then it's a problem if you want to get, get or take them um, as a prophylaxis. Yeah. 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 Every six months, you say, yeah. All right, so then we come to One Health, to the One Health approach. Um, Professor Mettenleiter, you were mentioning, of course, you were tackling a, a, already a little bit of the definition of the One Health approach. Now with this question coming up, is this, uh, you know, um, something new? Is this a new WHO um, with some improvements? How would you answer that? And of course, what's your take on that? I mean, one of the key issues in One Health is intersectoral cooperation. Um, and actually, I was very happy to see in, in mid-March that this quadripartite has actually been formed, which is a, a cooperation between WHO on the human side, OIE, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health on the animal side, FAO for the agriculture, and UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program for Environment and Ecosystems. And I think, I mean, this could indeed become a blueprint. I'm not in favor of a super WHO or, or, or whatever else uh, as a novel organization. I'm a, a firm believer in, in transparent cooperation. Uh, we still have some way to go also with these four organizations, I'm fully aware. But I think uh, with the quadripartite, we made a step forward. And last year with the creation under the patronage of these four organizations of the One Health High Level Expert Panel. I think, I mean, this is also an important step in, that, in this direction. So rather than creating a new super silo, uh, I'm just more in favor of linking the existing silos a lot better. Professor Ray, you were already trying to answer the question of, no, no, but, uh, of the audience. I think Thomas said, mm. well, I agree totally. But bridging the silos, it sounds easy. <laughs> but I guess it's a little bit difficult, <laughs> more difficult than it sounds. So what are the instruments and the methods to be very concrete and sharp and to share a little bit um, the essence of the bridge? 
Indeed, I mean, this sounds quite trivial. It's extremely difficult. Um, following up on the UK presidency of the G7 last year, uh, these four organizations uh, um, um, uh, created a One Health intelligence coping study uh, that just looks at the One Health projects, programs, intelligence in these four organizations, and already this is a major task. Um, this will probably last well into the year 2022. Uh, we are still, I mean, they are still working on that, and we are in, in, in contact with, with OLAP. Uh, but, but on the other hand, I mean, as long as they really have the, uh, how should I say, the will to cooperate, and this is something that I did use from the formation of the quadripartite, uh, I think, I mean, we are, I, I'm, at least I'm optimistic that this would work in the future as well. Now, what, what does that concrete, uh, concrete means? It means, for example, that, that uh, I mean, there is joint support for surveillance system that are already in existence on the animal side, on the human side, on, on the environmental side, water, for example, but they are not linked. So, I mean, I think this could be a rather whole hanging fru uh, low hanging fruit to bring these surveillance system together into one one health system, and in this context, I'm indeed in favor of creating a, 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 a new network, which uh, is not a network that focuses on humans, anthropocentric or animal-centric or nature-centric, but I mean, combining them. And this is one of the goals that we have in OLAB as well. And do you still stick to the definition of One Health, because earlier we've listened and we've heard it's called also maybe planetary health. So is there roof, room for improvement or room for creativity in naming it, or do you stick to One Health? Um, actually, there are different definitions. There is One Health, there's Global Health, there's Eco Health, there's Planetary Health. Uh, I mean, I may be forgiven, but as a proponent for One Health, for me, this is all One Health. Um, it's and, and, the, and the new definition of One Health that OLAP developed and that was unanimously actually uh, welcomed by the four partners as well as by the G7 ministers of, of, uh, of health, uh, this is an overarching definition and I would be very happy if you could all, all agree on one definition to get rid of this Babylonic, uh, I mean, difficulties that we have in, in, in definitions of these sub-levels of health. Uh, for me, there is no sub-level of health. There is just sorry, One Health. You earlier also mentioned One Health is of course a change of way of living, which means, and then we come to another topic that we touched on earlier, trust. Um, how, to, how to build up trust when we talk about One Health and how to build up trust when we talk about being prepared for the next pandemic without spreading too much fear when we are engaging with the civil society. I would just be interested in what's your take on that when we talk again about a little bit of communication because I think as we just listened to One Health can have different definitions, different uh, names. Um, how do you communicate it clearly that you build up trust and not just fear? I mean, first of all, communication is one of the four C's. So this is central to this One Health definition um, of OLAP. Um, in terms of trends, uh, how should I say, I mean, getting this, this, this communication going, I mean, I have certainly listened with interest uh, to the discussions this morning that we had. So the trust that is placed actually in, in, in science and in scientists, um, and definitely it's also for us a learning exercise. I mean, how can we transfer this knowledge more towards populations um, that, we, that we would like to target better? Um, and this also requires research. We had the discussion this morning as well. Uh, this is something which is underrepresented. It's probably not the most expensive research that needs to be done, but it just needs to be done. And these social aspects are so far quite neglected in terms of what we call pandemic preparedness or prevention, but I mean, for me, they are absolutely essential. Now, I also have to agree, I belong to a generation that did not grow up with Twitter and Instagram and TikTok, and, don't forget and, TikTok. Or TikTok or whatever. Um, but I mean, exactly, I mean, these are, these are the, the, um, the targets mm -hmm. and, and the influencers that we actually probably need to, to uh, get on board to bring these messages across. Absolutely, it's always interesting to, you know, building the bridges, but uh, we need building material for building the bridges, so that's... But I mean, important is also, if I could just add very briefly, important is also what has been said before, this, this, this simple language, so get the message across. We are scientists, so we are used, I mean, to write scientific papers, uh, which are highly complex, I mean, Felix can write papers. They are absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I don't ask how many of you really understand what's going on there. Um, but I mean, we need to get the message across here in, in this particular aspect. With Felix's work, it was clear that we have, that we need to, have, to manipulate, for example, this 
uh, spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 in a way that it becomes more immunogenic, period. So, I mean, the vaccine is better afterwards. Uh, and these are the messages that I think that, that we need to get across. And this is something that I think we all can just learn. Yeah, Professor Ziesig, I mean, you were part of the podcast, um, very famous podcast here in Germany with the colleague Drosten. And I think you learned it the hard way, the communication, because you were just, uh, you know, uh, falling into the situation that you, from now to tomorrow, you have to uh, explain the world and to, to the German audience the newest developments of the SARS-CoV pandemic. How, how do you look when we, how do you, lo you look on the topic when we talk about communication and the right communication of science to a broader audience? Yeah, I think it's very important. That is what I didn't realize before, to be honest. And um, it has to be clear and simple. That was already said. And maybe mm, I was thinking about how to continue. Maybe we have to start earlier. We have to go to schools and um, um, invest in, in education and schools in, in children and that they learn, I don't know, how a vaccine uh, works, for example. And I think there's a lot of um, yeah, things to improve in the future. Professor Medenleider. Yeah, just to come back to a discussion that we had last night at dinner, so we really had good discussions on scientific aspects, uh, where a colleague said, I mean, they, she had a, a, a child in, in uh, close to the, the end of school, so in the Oberstufe, and they didn't even talk in their biology uh, lessons uh, on COVID-19, for example. So, I mean, two years, this is the major event that's taking place in, in humankind, and it, it's, not, it's not even covered there. Uh, so, I mean, th I think this makes it clear that, I mean, where, where the gaps actually there are. There is a gap, obviously, yeah. Professor Rai, you wanted to add on something. Oh, yes, no, so it's to come back to what Peter Peel was saying this morning. Yeah. There is research to be funded into how to better communicate these things to the large people because it's, it's really extremely important. And in particular, scientists, they, to, to communicate what we don't know as well, which is as important sometimes of what we know. And the, the problems we had with the the pandemics, for instance, when journalists come to us, so we need to know and we need to provide an answers to reassure people. That's not what science is about. Science is about knowing something and the incertitudes that we need to uh, discover or find out. And to be able to say we don't know when. To, uh, and, and I think it's, there's a whole uh, vision of the way communication has to uh, be done in order to move ahead here. I mean, it's interesting. I have a feeling that communication is really a hot topic within the science because it's just not about, not only about the communication towards the civil society or to the media, towards the media, but also, of course, with policy makers, Professor Cizek, what would you say when we talk about communication and now we hand it over the recommendations today to the policy makers, what's important um, in that exchange? Hmm. It's a difficult question and I think it's very different because all scientists are different and also the poly policy makers are different and um, from my point of view I did a lot of studies in Hesse with the ministry and there it was always good um, that we have the same goals I would say and um, therefore it was easier to work together but um, I think for the policy makers, the most important requirements for me are uh, sustainability. That we don't forget in one or two years what happened in the pandemic, but that we continue to improve, to work on us, to, to um, yeah, work on basic research and um, also the education has to be continued. And I think this is one of the major yeah, uh, works we have to do. Professor Ray, you're nodding. Are you, do you agree or do you have to add on something when we talk also about finance, when we talk about policymakers? How do we get the, the money that we need to be prepared for pandemics? No, of course. I, I think uh, uh, science is underfunded. I, uh, I mean, in most of the countries where maybe perhaps some countries are better than others, but at least in the country where I work, there is a, a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, there are many neglected uh, topics on science that we should be invested on, and in particular on viruses, on, but also in many other aspects of the diseases that are causing. So I, I think uh, uh, if society 
can understand that the importance of having a, a, a very strong research environment and, and confidence on the research that is made, we would perhaps be much better prepared in, in, in the future. And what would you say, well, how, or how, would, how is it the most successful way to create a f sustainable flow of finance for the pandemic preparedness from your perspective? What is needed? Well, it's, it is important to commit to funds. Uh, for instance, some uh, companies will invest in antivirals, but only if they know that they will be paid back. So we need to figure out ways so that these investments are done, even if they are, there is no profit that will come in, a, in an immediate uh, way. So it's, it's an investment in the future. For instance. But that has to come from, I, I believe, from governments and from decisions that are made in advance and which will request to f finance better the, the, sci the, the scientific community. Mm. Professor Tizak, you were mentioning it's important to create incentives for the, for the industry sector. Um, where are we there? Or where, where would you say? Where is ro room for improvement? Did we learn the lessons in, in the pandemic times? that we need to create incentives and maybe that we m need to mobilize private capital to, to organize um, a, quick, a quick development? Or would you say this is really a, a homework that remains? I think it's a homework that remains and maybe you can ask me this question again in five years so that I can answer it. <laughs> but I think this is an important point because um, if we have antivirals not, um, yeah, not ready for phase two trials, then we can't use them in a pandemic situation. So there has to be an investment. And um, yeah, I think it's an important point, as also Felix mentioned. And um, it's hard to say how we will continue. So maybe this is a question for the next years to look back. <laughs> I have a look around. Are we? Do we have some open questions from you? Oh, wonderful. I see four hands. I love it. Very engaging. Great. We start with the second round and then we triple down. <laughs> Please tell us quickly who you are and then, of course, your concrete yeah. question. Thank so you. my name is Martin Visbeck. I'm actually an ocean and climate scientist, but I'm very interested in the One Health uh, uh, agenda in some ways. And I think I understand it rather well. I read up a bit about it and I agree with almost everything you said. But my, my question is actually goes a little bit beyond that. You know, five, six, seven years in 2015, uh, we really supported the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which includes climate change, health, biodiversity, in some ways, the future of our planet as, as, as from a human-centric point of view. And I wanted to invite you to give us the connection. How does sustainable development connect to the One Health approach? Is the One Health approach a subset of that focused on certain issues? Is it supporting it in the larger scale? Because I think we have to be a bit careful by generating new narratives all the time and then losing out on the ones that actually are trying to get us ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Medenleiter, we start with. Now, I would say the One Health approach is rooted in the sustainable development goals. And I mean, you find uh, some of them or many of them actually uh, in, in the definition, because I mean, this was one of the starting points that we had for the definition. Um, and this is why, why we tried to have a, a definition which, which is broader than the ones before. The one was basically, I mean, it's, it's, human, it's human health or human medicine, veterinary medicine, and something that has to do with the environment. So this is a, a lot more specific now. And I, mean, I mean, also think it's important now we have this linkage to climate change actually in the definition as well, because we are facing similar problems and similar issues, um, culminating in a change in, in habits and attitudes. And this is relevant for, I mean, uh, the, the avoidance of climate change, and it's also relevant for the avoidance of future pandemics. So, I mean, I, I agree in, in terms of joining forces. I also agree, uh, I mean, not to create new narratives all the time. Um, that's why I'm so strongly I mean, pro this One Health approach, which just by its wording says, I mean, there is this One Health. Thank you. The next question was just two rows behind. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm a medical student here in Berlin, and I have a question about, so I try to pose it as a fundamental question about the role of science in a democracy. Um, Professor Mettenleiter, you talked about, I think, uh, getting the message across and I think there could also be another opportunity to communicate science so to really educate 
people not to become scientists themselves, because of course not everybody can be a scientist in a society, but to really go a little bit further into detail, not to just tell one sentence, but to explain what is going on. And I would like to ask you what you think about what could there maybe the, be the advantage of really educate people to understand what's going on and to, de to decide on the fundament of real knowledge, scientific knowledge, to be critical. And that's also in the, in the context of trust, like wh where is the where is the border between trust and uncritical belief in everybody who seems to be important and knowing something? So I think in a democracy we want people to be critical and to think for themselves. And how do you think we could achieve that? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think for us it's primarily a matter of transparency. So basically making clear what we are doing and why we are doing it in terms of, of our scientific work. Um, in terms of how to bring the messages across, as I, as I call that, I mean, this is very much dependent, of course, of the target audience. Uh, I mean, you have to use a different language if you have, I mean, younger people in front of you than uh, if you have older ones, if you have sm more specialist ones, if you have the interested, interested public, quote unquote, as it's sometimes mentioned. Um, and they all require, I mean, specific wordings and also, uh, I would say, a specific policy of transfer, uh, transferring the messages. I'm, I, I fully agree, but science, per se, is always based on discussion. Science is always based on critical discussions, um, and this is basically what we are all are doing. I mean, mostly in a friendly way, but of course we do that and try either to verify our, our hypotheses or to falsify them. And if they are wrong, then I mean we have to start and thinking about the new hypothesis or modification or something like that. And this, is, and this is what science is all about. And I think this was a major message that was actually brought across also by, by, by the podcast, I'm, I mean, Christian and, and, and Sandra. I mean, scientists are not godlike, they are not infallible. I mean, they are learners, and this is what we are actually doing. So, I mean, we, what, what we say today is, I mean, to all what we extend we know is correct today, but it could be wrong tomorrow or the day after, or at least needed to be modified. Um, and these are the messages that we actually need, need to bring across. And, I mean, I, I feel the more open we are, the more we actually deserve the trust that is actually there. Mm -hmm. There was another question, uh, I think, yeah, wonderful. Oh, there was a lady in the back, but also the gentleman here. We start with, no, we start with the gentleman. Um, hello, I'm Moritz Alkofer. I do uh, physics in Berlin too. And um, I have a question regarding the One Health approach as well. So you talked about the concept and the organization of it. And I wanted to ask if you could name like um, the, some concrete examples where it would be helpful. I like the ideas of concrete examples. Wonderful question. I can give you two concrete, uh, concrete examples from my background, which is uh, director of a veterinary institute. So we're focusing on that aspect. For example, um, um, many of the African countries have now excellent One Health programs and plans, national plans, coordinating, for example, the interaction between human medicine, between veterinary medicine, and what they have in the environmental sector. This is a national plan. Uh, just by the way, we don't have a national One Health strategy in Germany yet, hopefully, uh, and this is something um, that could also be relayed. I also do that. Um, and the second point is looking back in, 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 into the pandemic. Um, from my point of view, um, that's why I was stressing it. I mean, I think we need to have the competence and the capacities of all people involved that could help to solve this problem than actually mobilized. Um, and this was also not the case here. Uh, again, talking about veterinarians, it took uh, more than half a year and, and three uh, uh, amendments of the, of the Infectious Disease Act before veterinarians could just do the testing for SARS-CoV-2. I mean, we are doing multi-species testing all the time, and humans are just one, one more species. Uh, but this was heavily opposed at, at the beginning. Uh, and then we had the same discussion with vaccination later on as well. This is, I mean, this is probably a rather tiny bit, but it, it really um, exemplifies that we have to change minds, that it is clear the next time that, of course, we need to mobilize everything that's helpful. Now, you let... Absolutely, thank you. Hi, I'm Isabel Ennal. I'm a global health physician. And my question is, what is your idea how we can ensure um, access to treatment to 
um, people at risk globally in the next pandemic? And also maybe this is rather a political question, but what, what contribution can science bring to that in terms of science collaborations mm -hmm. and so on? Thank you very much. Herr Mettenleiter, Professor Mettenleiter, I know you've talked a lot, but I would pinpoint the question also to you, the first question, and the second half of the question to the others. I mean, science is, of course, relevant to get this thing started in the first place. Um, so, I mean, the development of, of uh, broad-spectrum antivirals is at the moment still a goal. I mean, a dream, mm. basically. We want to have that. Uh, I mean, we have scientific knowledge that, that can be um, fed into this development. Uh, we are not certain that it will actually work in the end. Um, but, I mean, these different approaches that, that, that Sandra mentioned in terms of targeting the virus, targeting the host as a, as a central requirement in particular for viruses, uh, I mean, these are aspects that uh, without science wouldn't have been uh, basically on the table at the moment. So, um, th this is definitely relevant. In terms of access later on, I mean, this is not a scientific aspect. I mean, this is more than a political aspect. I mean, how can we assure that, I mean, these, these benefits that we get from the developments are then equally available in the different, different areas, in different populations, in different societies? Uh, and we have uh, talked about this this morning as well. Um, this is a challenge, but I mean, again, in COVID-19, at least people started and politicians started to think about that. I mean, how uh, we can um, attain more equity the next time. Professor Ray, when we talk about accessibility of the most uh, of vaccines, for example, for the most vulnerable people in our on our planet, and we saw the map earlier this morning that there is an inequality of of the distribution of vaccine. How do you look on it? Where do you see the homework for policymakers um, to actually bridge the gap here? Well, it, it, it is essential. We are seeing all of these new variants that are coming out because of the virus circulates without control in countries that are not vaccinated. So as long as we don't uh, figure out a way to have the whole planet uh, completely vaccinated, uh, we are still going to have that problem. But it goes back to the issue of certain companies have invested huge amounts of uh, money into getting that vaccine ready and they want to get the payback. So how, uh, and, and this is a very political issue and it will have to be taken account. It was done for HIV, for those drugs uh, uh, several years ago where an agreement was found and the patents will drop and, and th there must be some legislation that allow that in case of pandemics of the global threats like this, uh, there is a limit to what you can limit the drugs. But also to other, to uh, address to that question, um, what the science can do, uh, scientists will help uh, creating new therapies. And of course, the idea is to make them as available as possible. The problem is uh, the, the financement of the particular treatments that can be very expensive to develop. Uh, should the tax money contribute more to that or how many how much is to private enterprises and that is there are these public partner uh, PPP uh, public private partnership very partnerships or that some systems that should be worked out uh, for this type of but when we also raise up the question about um, collaboration in science don't you get tired of always debating about oh we need to collaborate more that's not a new thing is it or is it, is it a new thing to discuss about science collaboration or collaboration well, within the science? Science is built on collaboration. I collaborate with Thomas. Uh, we, we all need the others. We, cannot, we don't know everything. Each of us provides a little piece of something that makes a big uh, castle in the end. And so uh, science is all about collaboration, I would say. So uh, I don't know. Professor Cizek, or straight to the collaboration question? I mean, just, just to put it to the ground, I mean, also the development of, of these vaccines, it didn't occur in the last 12 or 24 months. I mean, there were decades of, of, of scientific research before that. Um, and actually, we cooperated with, for example, uh, one of these companies um, more than 10 years ago and, and proved that the things work, for example, in, in a few animal models. So, I mean, the, the, the perception that suddenly in, in, in February 2020, uh, I mean, the BioNTech boss woke up uh, and, and, and had this 
idea of producing a vaccine. Uh, I mean, this was a long-term commitment and a long-term development in science and research. Yeah, maybe coming back to the question, which is really important, I think. Um, and as a researcher, I don't know what I can really do there, but maybe I mentioned the contracts between industry and universities. And I know that some uh, universities didn't sign contracts with industry if, um, for example, the drug that uh, was developed was not um, given to all of um, yeah, other nations, for example, or was sp specific for, I don't know, one, one country. And maybe this is one thing that we have to look in this contract and um, that it's fair for all sides, university and industry, but maybe also um, if a drug will come available that that this is also in this um, contract um, mentioned there. I think that's the only thing I can do as a researcher. Yeah. Are there any more questions from your side, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests? Otherwise, we talk about monkeypox now, <laughs> I would assume. <laughs> well, you've got the first case in Frankfurt. That's literally what the media is saying. Uh, Professor Zizek, maybe you can you know, take us with you uh, in your everyday life. How do you start now as a clinical virologist and how do you go, go on with the first case now in Frankfurt? Do you look for old primers? Uh, yes. Yeah. How, do you, how do you, what's the step one? And you also brought some images yeah, of I, the monkey pox. Yeah, we saw them before. <laughs> so uh, yes, um, it's, it was not the first case in Germany, but the first case in Frankfurt. I think it was the tenth in Germany. And this is for a clinical virologist, of course, um, exciting. Um, Let's have a virus. look. I have never seen pox before. And um, then you go to your freezer and uh, try to find some primers and a PCR, which might be the right. And uh, of course, you can also uh, it's the last slide. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm just signing. It's it's the last slide because this is. And um, yeah, of course. Then you go to the freezer, talk with the team who has ideas, and you look for commercial kits from diagnostics. And um, ah, this is our our pictures. And so, what do we see? Tell yeah. us. <laughs> First case in Frankfurt. <laughs> this is monkeypox. <laughs> no, and uh, uh, we were lucky to have an electron microscopy in our institute. It's a very old institute. The electron microscope is from 1970. I don't know. A really old one. And normally the, the virology institutes don't have this anymore. And, um, yeah, and yeah, still working. And no one who can use this microscope. And then so we are not prepared to get more, or are we prepared when we have these? Yeah, we, 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 yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I think normally we do PCR testing and um, yeah, then we got the first samples and didn't know what will expect us. And then we um, looked in our electron microscopy and um, find the virus as shown here. We found it. So on the left side, there's one monkey pox. On the right side, there are four. And um, yeah, and then we performed PCR testing with the old primers and new ones and um, yeah, diagnosed the first case in Frankfurt, I think, a few days before. And of course, we read a lot in the news and I think, you know, we are the, the majority of the civil society, they are not virologists. So d what, what's, what's an important message because today it, um, also people from, from all different silos, bubbles, are watching us today. What is important to communicate when we talk about monkeypox and we, you know, when we don't want to spread, of course, some fear, but rather um, some solutions? And so maybe that it's not from the monkey and you don't have to cuddle a monkey to get it? <laughs> No, I think first of all you have to communicate basic uh, knowledge of the virus like you would communicate to your students in the university that was uh, I did in at Twitter I think uh, a week before and um, this helps a lot of people to understand uh, yeah, what kind of disease this is and um, to learn where it comes from, how to get it, how to treat it. I think these are the the information the people want to know. And the people at the radio stations, Professor Mettenleiter, you just gave some interviews, they also wanted to know how do we need to be prepared for the monkeypox. So what's the message? 
I mean, the message for monkeypox, as for many other infections, is, I mean, keep your hygienic standards up. I think, I mean, what we did in the last two years in the pandemic, we rediscovered hygiene. And I think, I mean, this is the most important issue uh, because, I mean, this is not something specific for one agent. This is, uh, I mean, overarching. I mean, monkeypox is, a, is an interesting case study because, it, I mean, it has been clear for, or at least discussed for, I mean, since, since the, uh, the demise of, of the uh, variola virus in the 1980s or early 1980s, that monkeypox could be one of the candidates to fill this gap that variola actually, uh, variola actually left. And, I mean, just in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, since uh, early this year, they had more than 12,000 cases, uh, uh, 1,200 cases. So this is not a rare spillover event. This is not a completely novel virus. This is not something that is absolutely unexpected. So it's something that we know, that we know since 1948, um, where we fortunately have a vaccine and have a therapeutic available. Um, but still, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, it becomes interesting for us in the society uh, only when it pops up here. Um, and I think this is the awareness that we need to raise. Uh, these are the, the, the situations wherever they are. Uh, I mean, this is not restricted to Africa or Asia. I, I mean, this, is, this can happen in, anywhere. Um, but these are the situations that we need to really take seriously. Um, and uh, I mean, what I mean, we experience at the moment, what happens if we don't take them too seriously? Mm. Professor Ray. Yeah. So. This is, as Thomas just said, there is a vaccine, the same vaccine that was used to eradicate smallpox. It works also against smallpox. But the last doses of vaccine were like 50 years ago to eradicate uh, uh, smallpox, and then people are not vaccinated anymore, and you start seeing it coming up. So now the questions are, could it become more virulent? Could it adapt to better transcription? There are many questions, and it's dangerous to let these things propagate as they are now. So even though it doesn't seem to be a very, very bad virus, uh, we need to watch out because it's just an example of many, multiple things that could emerge. Mm. Yeah. Professor Cizek, when we talk about the first case now in Frankfurt, and of course talking, we earlier talked about how we need to talk also with the policy makers. So how are you in contact and in communication with the policy makers? Uh, did I call you every day and ask for new numbers and new ideas and new details that they need to implement in the regulations? Or what, what is the, bit, the most Pressing communication. Hopefully they don't. <laughs> Hopefully they don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, I think it depends on the time. So there were, when I look back at last COVID two, there were times that they call regularly and ask for help. And um, but normally you have meetings with different um, disciplines, with um, different uh, people. Um, and yeah, exchange each other and talk about the virus, what has to be done, um, what can be improved, for example, but not on a regular basis in the moment. And I think it will start again in, in, in fall or in winter, maybe, but in the moment it's, um, it's quiet. <laughs> what, do the, what, what do you answer if the question comes up, where are we heading in fall? Do we have an increasing number of COVID-19 numbers? Do we have, do we have something to keep in mind already now, when we are now in May, June? Do we forget something? What's coming up in September, October, November? I'm always looking to Australia, for example, and there we can see that the flu infections raise, and very early there's um, an increase of flu infections, and I think this might also happen here in Europe, um, and we have to prepare for this by vaccinating um, not too late uh, in the year. So normally, um, um, I always say just take your flu shot in December, for example. I think this will be different this year. Um, I think the COVID-19 um, cases will increase again. And it strongly depends, and this was what we saw in the talk in the morning, uh, depends on the variant that is circulating and um, the immune escape um, and, of course, the vaccination status and how long um, the vaccine will protect us from, from severe disease. And therefore, it's hard to make predictions that are exactly, but I think these are the major um, yeah, factors that we have to keep in mind. Professor Ray, 
What do you see in fall? What do I see? I, I know I, I don't have crystal ball, but uh, I expect that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 will not go away by magic. It will come. We know already that the infection with the BA1 Omicron does not protect again. BA4 and BA5 that are circulating in South Africa now. So we can expect to, we might, if we are lucky, it will become attenuated by itself, but it could. So I have no crystal ball. And Professor Medenleiter, last but not least. No, it's my, that's my crystal ball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, COVID-19 is a respiratory infection, and respiratory infections m mostly show seasonality. So I think, I mean, this is this is a pretty solid uh, prediction that we have for for, for fall. Um, I think it's also rather solid in saying we will see more influenza cases. Um, basically, influenza completely dropped out in the last two years, um, which was. I mean, at, at, at least to me, also an, a clear aspect of the efficacy of the methods, uh, and uh, in, in particular the non-pharmaceutical interventions, actually, um, that, that were introduced. Um, uh, so, I mean, for a virologist uh, that also is interested in epidemiology, it's, it's absolutely fascinating that we have these waves of influenza, and then we have two years absolutely flat. Um, this will probably rise again, uh, and, and I would uh, agree with what Sandra said. Uh, I mean, get your flu shot, definitely and get your flu shot earlier than in, in, in previous years. Thank you very much to Professor Dr. Felix Rai, Director of the Virology Department at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Thank you very much to Professor Dr. Sandra Zizek, Director of the Institute of Medical Virology at the University Hospital of Frankfurt and Professor of Medical Virology at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And last but not least, thank you also to Professor Dr. Thomas Mettenleiter, President of the Friedrich Löffler Institute and Co-Chair of the One Health High Level Expert Panel of the FAO. Thank you. This is your round of applause. Thank you. And we don't have a break, we continue straight away, and I think there's going to be another chair coming up. So thank you very much for this fruitful discussion, and of course for uh, looking into fall. We're going to hopefully have a lot of topics to debate then, when we see each other next time again. Thank you. Now we talk about climate change from ocean and cryosphere to decarbonization, ladies and gentlemen. And I think there's also one more chair coming up. So we are, of course, in the topic, um, when we talk about life, as we all know, it depends directly or indirectly on the ocean. And the ocean plays a pivotal and central role in regulating the climate. It also harbors an enormous amount of biodiversity and supplies oxygen, food, and renewable energy. And the consequences of climate change, we listened to that already in the morning, um, the consequences are seen in the high latitudes and altitudes. Hence, the polar ocean and the cryosphere act as one of our planet's efficient early warning systems. The question is always, we have an early warning system, do we listen, and what do we do? This is something that we'd like to tackle in the panel discussion. Same procedure, we'd like to hear two inputs with the recommendations that were handed over this morning to the G7 presidency, and then we head into our debate. Thank you. So for the first uh, Science 7 recommendation, I warmly welcome the Professor of Climate System Analysis at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and she's also a member of the Earth Commission since 2019, Professor Dr. Ricarda Winkelmann. Yeah, thank you very much and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. We now turn our attention to the ocean and the cryosphere. And before we get into the details, I think it is important to remind ourselves that really all our lives depend directly or indirectly on the ice and the ocean. And the scale at which we're changing both is almost unimaginable. Each year, 400 billion tons of ice are getting lost from Greenland and Antarctica alone. And we also witness mountain glaciers that are retreating everywhere around the globe. As a result, sea levels are rising, and they are rising at a faster and faster pace. Permafrost is thawing in all regions of the Arctic, 
and the related CO2 and methane release could further amplify, amplify global warming and the related climate impacts. Worldwide, the ocean is warming, it's acidifying, and losing oxygen at an unprecedented rate. Because it takes up a large portion of our CO2 emissions, the ocean is now more acidic than at any time over the past two million years, and the acidity is still rising. The ocean is also taking up most of the extra heat from global warming, so in a way it's saving us from even further increasing temperatures at present. And we also see how marine heat waves have doubled in frequency. They're occurring more and more often, and they've increased um, in frequency um, yeah, twice as much since the 1980s. Over the same period, we have lost half of the Arctic uh, sea ice area in summer. Around the world, oxygen minimum zones in the open ocean have expanded by several million square kilometers, and hundreds of coastal sites now have dangerously low oxygen concentrations. In parts, they are getting too low to maintain healthy ecosystems. So as a result of climate change, marine species are on the move, and many of them are actually shifting poleward. Our polar regions have also been hit by a number of extreme events. In the past two years alone, we have um, had record temperatures both in the Arctic and in Antarctica, where temperatures reached an unprecedented plus 18 degrees centigrade in Antarctica and plus 38 degrees in the Arctic. In addition, a series of extreme melt events has been recorded on Greenland in recent years. So while these are only snapshots in time, they really reveal the radical and impactful shifts that are currently occurring in ice and ocean. And the polar regions are our planet's most efficient early warning systems, and these early warning systems are now raising the alarm. What is more, with progressing global warming, we will be causing more and more irreversible changes in ice and ocean. We risk triggering self-perpetuating feedback processes and crossing so-called tipping points in the climate system. These tipping points are critical thresholds that once we cross them, they will lead to long-term irreversible changes, so changes that cannot be halted again. To give you just one example for such a self-perpetuating feedback from the ice sheets, with ongoing warming, the surface of Greenland is melting and thus sinking to lower heights. And as we all know from mountain climbing, as we climb from the peak of a mountain to the valley, it's getting warmer around us. And the same happens to the ice sheets. So as the ice sheet surface is lowering due to the increased surface melt, it is also getting into warmer air masses, which again is causing more melt, further sinking, and so on and so forth. So this is one of those self-perpetuating feedbacks. There are actually a number of these feedbacks related to ice and ocean in the climate system. That also means that ice and ocean are some of the most vulnerable parts of the climate system. And they have a very long memory, meaning some of the impacts occurring there unfold continuously over hundreds or even thousands of years. And this may be hard to wrap our minds around, but our decisions today and in the coming years, they irreversibly change the face of our planet for centuries or even millennia to come. So to avoid some of these most severe and potentially cascading impacts to our life support system, our planet, we must take action now. And given the historic and ongoing greenhouse gas emissions, the G7 states actually have a particular responsibility in leading our efforts to protect the climate, the ocean, and the polar regions. We therefore call on the G7 governments to provide the following leadership. First, we must, and this will come as no surprise, increase our efforts to rapidly and ambitiously reduce greenhouse gas emissions to protect the ocean and the cryosphere and the climate system as a whole. This means accelerating the worldwide just transition to carbon neutrality. It means protecting the sensitive Arctic and Antarctic regions and their resources. And it also means that we now include these long-term changes in our present-day thinking. And I think this is really important that we consider the different timescales that um, we're dealing with when it comes to climate change. Second, we need to strengthen the capacity of the ocean biosphere to actually contribute to the mitigation of climate change. 
That means we need to restore marine ecosystems and biological carbon sinks. It means we have to significantly reduce pollution and overuse. And it also means that we have to establish marine protected areas that cover at least 30% of the global ocean. Third, we need to engage all forms of knowledge. This is a global effort. So we need to more research into the state of the ocean and the cryosphere and also their dynamics. We need to halt and reverse biodiversity loss and apply environmental economics. And it is imperative that we include all kinds of knowledge and that includes indigenous knowledge in both the natural and the social sciences. And lastly, we need to enhance international scientific cooperation. And this is where it also relates to the One Health debate that we just had. Um, so we need to share our data for an Earth observation and forecasting system in a way thinking about an Earth health index. So what is our planetary um, health actually, including humans and nature? And that includes that we need to provide access and share infrastructures and capacities. We need to advance our modeling, for instance, through supercomputing, and we need to ensure continuous observations and address critical knowledge gaps. So as I said initially, our life as we know it depends on a functioning and stable ocean and cryosphere. It is therefore high time that we act to restore the crucial balance in the marine and polar systems. And in light of the severity, longevity, and irreversibly of ongoing and potential changes, we cannot shy away from our responsibility, especially towards future generations. And with that, thank you very much. And I will hand over to the next speaker, Otmar Edenhofer. Thank you very much. Stay with me on, on the stage. I warmly welcome also Professor Dr. Otmar Edenhofer. He is the director and the chief economist of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, as well as the director of the Mercato Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change and professor for climate economics and public policy at the Technische Universität Berlin. It's a great honor to have you on board. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. I would like to give you a little bit of background about decarbonization. Since Putin starts the war in the Ukraine, we can observe a very important fact which changes our uh, view on the decarbonization process. Because due to this war, gas prices are increasing faster than the coal price. And this has a very dramatic implication for investment strategies around the globe, in particular in Asia. The gas-fired plants become less competitive. And what we see that the ongoing renaissance of coal, in particular in Asia, is ongoing. And the most recent IPCC report has highlighted that when we continue this investment strategy, the existing, the planned coal-fired plants over the economic lifetime would produce roughly 330 gigatons CO2, which is basically the full carbon budget which is available or which is consistent with the 1.5 degree limit. If we add not only the coal-fired plants but also other components of the infrastructure, like road, building, and so on, we would produce another 500 gigatons. So this basically shows that when we do not act now and agree on a global coal phase out, we will close the door to the 1.5 limit and even to the two degree limit in an irreversible way in the next decade. So therefore, it is clear that emission reductions are not aligned with the two degree target. And I would say this is a little bit a, a, a quite an, a, a, a modest way to express this because emissions are still rising and rising. In the last decade, it was a little bit one, uh, roughly 1%. In the decade before, it was 2.3%. We haven't bent the curve. And therefore, we are not on a pathway of net zero emissions by 2050. If we would like to do this, we have to bend the curve immediately. 
and this uh, requires action and leadership. And within our, uh, uh, in, in our recommendation, we highlighted two fundamental strategies. The first one is direct electrification, for example, invest in e-mobility, but also indirect electrification, producing hydrogen, synthetic fuels, and so on. 100% renewables, or let's say 100% carbon-free technologies are not good enough for a decarbonization pathway. So in addition to uh, carbon-free technologies in the power sector, we need hydrogen, synthetic fuels, and so on, in order to transform and decarbonize not only the electricity sector, but the transport, the heating, cooling uh, industry, and agricultural sector. And by the way, uh, the unavoided or the unavoidable emissions, which we basically have to live with, require negative emission technologies absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. So this is a huge challenge and therefore we recommend first build a carbon neutral and a resilient energy system. Phasing out fossil fuel energy, in particular coal, is very, very important and the coal phase out is one of the top uh, global international priorities. Of course, climate damaging subsidies is another important step and this important step is uh, very, very important in the G7 and also in the subsequent G20 process. Second, decarbonize, electrify and apply alternative fuels in critical sectors, ensure energy security, diversify supply and mitigate disruptions. And in the next few months, in particular in Europe, we have to diversify our uh, demand on oil and gas. The second important cornerstone in our recommendation is strengthen international cooperation because the climate problem is a global problem and therefore we need and have to ensure international cooperation. International cooperation is ensured and enhanced by international trade and in particular we need trading in the renewable energy system because it is almost impossible uh, that, we, that countries rely only on their domestic resources. A second important step is to establish a carbon pricing mechanism, a CO2 minimum price at the global scale. Why is this important? A carbon price has three fundamental functions. The first one is it makes carbon-free technologies competitive. Secondly, it phases out the fossil fuels, and this is something which we haven't done in the past. We have uh, invested a lot in renewables, but we haven't been able to phase out fossil fuels. And the third component of CO2 pricing or carbon pricing is it generates revenues, and these revenues can be used for social compensation. Third, promote climate alliances. So in the G7 and in the G20, a climate club or an important climate alliance is important to create a, a level playing field. And creating such a level playing field is important among the main emitters. Third, strengthen climate literacy and citizens' involvement. Reduce the barriers uh, to low carbon consumption, promote behavioral change in energy saving, travel and dietary change. Create alternatives so that incentives can work. And educate on the co-benefits of renewable energy and in the broader sense about the co-benefits of carbon neutrality. So make citizens aware what are the true costs and what are the true benefits. Fourth, promote research as well as technological and social innovation towards climate neutrality. Invest in basic research. This is very important because we don't believe the, we know everything about carbon neutrality basic research and R&D investments are desperately needed. A very important example are carbon dioxide removal technologies. Monitor energy and emission data and standardize methods to report greenhouse gas sources and sinks. Support technologies, policies and routine, routine, routines for, carbon neutral, uh, for a carbon neutral lifestyle. So these are our recommendations. And I think these are quite 
good recommendations, but one thing is quite important. I believe that we have to take action very soon, and we have to do this in a situation of multiple crises. We have not the luxury to solve one crisis after another. We have to solve all the relevant crises once a time, and I think we can do this if we are courageous and if we are smart. And this is, I hope, that humankind in the end is courageous and smart enough. Thank you very much. Mr. Edenhofer, may I ask you to join us as well on stage? Wonderful. To the right, thank you. I also warmly welcome now on the podium the geophysicist and the 22nd president of the US National Academy of Sciences. And previously, she served as editor in chief of the journal Science and as science advisor to the United States Secretary of the Interior. With us is Professor Dr. Marsha McNutt. A warm welcome. And we also do have with us Professor Dr. Maria Cristina Marcuzzo, uh, Foreign Secretary of the Academia Nazionale dei Linze in Rome and Professor in Political Economy. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Professor McNutt, when you were listening to the talks that we just had, and of course, um, working for the recommendations and the handovers. What do you see? Because there's a lot of information around, but what are for you the essential priorities, again, for our topic of today? And with all the questions that are mingling around, but what is the priority that you also put every day on your desk? I saw the incredible speed with which science reacted to the pandemic. And every day I think, how do we bring the same urgency to the climate crisis? How do we make something which is a problem that science has known about for several decades now, to the forefront of conscious where people feel like, I have to act now. You look at how quickly people moved from going to the work every day to staying home, how quickly people um, learned to communicate with each other over Zoom, how quickly we all um, changed our habits of how we even interacted with our own families. And we need to bring that same urgency to the climate crisis. One thing that uh, I, I believe we as scientists need to do is learn how to create actionable science, actionable scientific advice. And that is something that um, is somewhat counter to how we as scientists most like to work. We like to be very deliberative. We like to state what are all the uncertainties and are all the reasons why what we've done might be wrong and what needs to be done to prove everything to the final decimal point. And in an emergency, we don't have time to do that. So actionable science really says, what does the science say the no regrets actions are now? That even if our science isn't perfect, if we do this, we will never regret it. And that this is the kind of action which right now, any uncertainties will not negate. And I think we have to do that a lot more and, and bring this urgency from the pandemic. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and of course a little bit from your desk, of the priority of your desk. Thank you very much. Same question goes to you, Professor Makutsu. When we, we, we all have different questions in our mind, but what keeps you busy in your daily work and when you reflect on the S7 process, um, working towards the recommendations, what is your essence that you'd like to share with us? What is the priority from your side? Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've been always thinking what economists can do about it. And I didn't come up with a very positive answer to that. 
if I think the kind of economics that is standard nowadays seems to me so far remote uh, from um, the kind of attitude that is needed and just been mentioned, how to induce changes in behavior, okay? Economics is much more concerned in, in an attitude which I would call to be descriptive rather than trans trying to make transformations uh, in society. And uh, so this is my first worry. How do we bring economics closer to the kind of challenges that uh, the climate problem is raising to us? Secondly, uh, not all economics theory, but mostly economic theory, is market driven, mm. okay? Everything goes through markets. Everything needs to be done uh, through the market mechanism, which is a good thing for a lot of issues. But as far as climate change is concerned, we are facing market failure, absent markets, uh, pricing mechanism, is not something that can be relied upon entirely as addressing this issue. So my really concern is that how we transform economics uh, in order to address this kind of issue. I'm not saying there is not good work done on the economics of climate change, quite the contrary. But I think that the problem is much larger than the specialization on, on, on just this concept. And so this is my worry nowadays. And when I was asked to join this uh, panel, I say, I'm not going to say something very useful because I'm an economist. But then I thought maybe if I try um, to be less of an economist and more of a social scientist, generally speaking, maybe I might have something to say. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Professor Edenhofer, when you, you also have two economists here uh, on the panel, would you agree or would you um, also say that, of course, it's, it's when we talk about the transformation of the energy system and you just um, brought the recommendations with you, we need to talk with different silos and bubbles, economists, social uh, scientists, and of course also uh, different, different fields. So what, what are your expectations for a good communication towards a successful dialogue when we talk about the transformation of the energy system? Yeah, that's a, a complicated question. And so um, uh, hopefully at the end of our panel, we can agree. For the time being, I would like to disagree with you strongly. So at the end, so that we can have a lively debate. So first of all, I would like to start with the following. Martin Weizmann called the climate problem as a problem from hell. And this problem from hell definitely pushes economics to its limits. However, I would say three following things. It is a myth that economics is mainly focused on markets. This is not the case. Economics is mainly focused on market failures. We are talking endlessly, and this is rightly so, about under what conditions markets fail. And there's a strong agreement among economists that climate change is the biggest markets failure humankind has ever seen. The second point is, so who can cure the market failure? And I would say there are two important actors here, and, and, and this is, uh, from my point of view, the, the, the fundamental limit. It's the civil society and it's our nation states. It is the first time in human history that we need at the global scale a voluntary agreement to impose on humankind a new type of scarcity. When we say we won't only emit, let's say, 1,000 gigatons CO2 or 700 gigatons CO2 into the atmosphere, and we transform a common pool resource like the atmosphere into a real commons via self-enforcing contracts at a global scale, this is something which we have never done in, in human history. But this is the challenge. And I would not argue that economists and social scientists in particular are very good to come up with very good ideas how to solve the international cooperation problem. 
but at least we are working on this. And this has nothing to do that we are exclusively focused on markets. The second aspect which I would like to highlight is the following. We have a long experience, I would say even four decades, with environmental policy. And we have been very successful as a human society to solve local environmental problems, like local air pollution, uh, even the ozone layer and so on. And we did this with very powerful instruments, like bands, like technology standards and so on. But I believe that the climate problem is much, much more complicated. Because if you think about the climate problem, what we have to do is, solving the climate problem is the largest, by far, the largest policy-induced structural change of our economy, uh, econo uh, economies since industrialization. Again, we have never done such a thing. We have seen structural change, we have seen innovation, but we haven't seen uh, 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 a policy-induced structural change at this scope which is required to achieve carbon neutrality or CO2 neutrality by mid of, se of the century. For this transformation process, the instruments which have been very successful in the past for environmental policy, like technology standards, like bans and even subsidies, will no longer be successful. One important aspect and here you might, you might speculate that I'm a very standard neoclassic economist, but I'm not. But nevertheless, I would argue that carbon pricing is an absolutely necessary step to solve that problem. I'm not so sufficient, but it is necessary. For me, the crucial thing is why it is so complicated that at the global scale, at the national scale, politicians have such a hard time to implement such a policy instrument. And this is something which has a lot to do with political economy, and you are a specialist in political economy. I am less uh, because I am so puzzled about political decisions that I cannot figure out what is the underlying rationality. I hope you can help me here. But one thing I would like to highlight here is, is, is the following. And this is something which we did, which we, we missed in the past. We haven't understood that climate policy and climate change is fundamentally a distributional problem. And policymakers are focused on, 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 on solving distributional problems, and therefore carbon pricing alone is not good enough. We have to solve the distrib underlying distributional problems. I think we have done over the last few years very good studies to, to, uh, to, to understand that better, and also to come up with proposals to do this in a much better way. But politically, this is obviously, from my point of view, really the hard problem to solve this underlying distributional problems. But this is my last statement. Whatever you think about how to solve the distributional problems, for solving the distributional problems, to compensate in particular the poor, low-income households, you need money. And carbon pricing, at least, provides revenues to solve that problem. And this is the third function I mentioned already in my talk, by carbon pricing is so important and it is a shame and it is a huge problem for a better understanding why this obviously so important instrument is, uh, is, is so insufficiently implemented in our current climate policy plans. Can I? Thank you. Absolutely. What do, what do you Well, I'm glad that uh, we have some debate going on rather than, you know, the story that the, if they are uh, four economists in a room, there are five opinions going on. So this is typical. Uh, I'm not sure when you said we, which we we talking about. I fully agree with you. There are areas in economics that address uh, market failure, absent markets. I fully agree with you that Nobel prizes be given to Olis Ostrom for doing the commons. I fully agree that recent Nobel prize has been done to work done on nudges and so forth. But mainstream economics is not what you're talking about. And the mainstream economics is the kind of economics that has been unable to address the financial crisis in 2007. 
Um, the mainstream economics is still very much uh, rooted uh, in, in, a, in a way that explains why the climate change problem has not been addressed properly. So I think we agree that there are areas of, of economics that are useful for uh, dealing with the problem, but I would still maintain that neoclassical economics, just to keep the jargon, doesn't seem um, fit for the purpose. And I've just read before coming here a very um, nice article by Nic Nicola Stern on the Economic Journal in which he's making exactly the point I'm making, and that uh, economists uh, are failing to see that the kind of issue that climate change implies need a different kind of conceptual apparatus. And I think that's exactly what you've been saying in your last slide. Uh, but this doesn't come within economic theory. That's the point I'm making. The kind of suggestion you're making, with which I fully agree entirely, and I liked your last slide because as all these issues, but they don't come, economic theory will not help you to do that, with the exception, perhaps, of carbon price. But you ask the proper question. Why is it so difficult to um, persuade um, uh, governmental leaders to agree on, on, on phasing out carbon on the basis of pricing system? Well, economic theory will not give you an answer. Um, and but who will give then the answer to that? <laughs> Professor Inu. Just, just to make one joke, um, do you know how many economists are needed to repair a car? Yeah, well, I, rem I, mean, I don't remember that joke, but there's so many jokes about economists that... <laughs> None, because the market would do it. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that basically we agree, it's just that I will ease as a much more positive attitude towards the work that is done. I'm not a, a, a climate economist, so maybe I'm missing out important work that is done in that area, but I know my fellow economists when they do other things, and I sometimes I am afraid that they are too much abstract, they are too much... Uh, reliance on on kind of model that like in the case of financial crisis turn out to be wrong simply wrong so i'm wondering and i'm, I'm making the point that nicola stern uh, made uh, that uh, we need a different type of economics uh, to deal with the climate change i hear from everybody not just here on the panel but from everyone talking today the word urgency Everybody on this stage today used the word, it's urgent, we need to take action, we don't have time. So, uh, Professor Winkelmann, um, when we look again now on this debate, which also brings up an urgency, talking with policymakers also, and looking at the developments, where do you see the priorities that we just tackled on and started with our debate with? Yeah, first of all, I think um, we're actually dealing with a clash of timescales. So there's the urgency on the one hand, the urgency to take action, uh, the fact that we know that we have very few years remaining to actually meet um, the, the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so that's the one hand side. But then on the other hand side, we're dealing with very long time scales. And that is because in some of the systems that we're dealing with in the climate system, and the ocean and cryosphere are two of those, um, where we have a lot of inertia in the system. And also we're dealing with potentially irreversible changes in these systems. And that brings in longer timescales. It means that we might now trigger changes that we cannot reverse anymore. That means we change the face of our planet. And these changes unfold over potentially hundreds to thousands of years. And this is difficult for us to understand and also to communicate um, that we're dealing with this clash of time scales, so the trigger time and then the time it takes to unfold. Just to give one example, sea level rise, for instance. Even if we were to stop global warming today, sea levels would still continue to rise well beyond the end of this century, and even rising at an accelerating pace. So this means that the bulk of sea level rise actually doesn't happen in the next decades, but after that. So how do we deal with the fact that we're leaving these kinds of impacts up to future generations to solve? 
And I think this clash of timescales is, is what we're dealing with and what makes it so difficult to deal with the climate issue, um, also in comparison to other crises. Some of the impacts simply seem far away, even though they're not. So I think one central thing that we need to do and that we scientists also can help with is to bring these future long-term impacts into our present day thinking. So I think that to me would be a crucial goal to achieve, to start thinking a, a bit longer term. Professor um, McNutt, what's your answer to that, thinking of different timescales? And of course, uh, having in mind what the G7 is actually debating, end of June, stronger together as the fifth pillar of the, of the main thematic titles. How do we manage to do it? So uh, let me just add to what Ricardo said, which I agree with completely, another threat because of the disconnect between the time scale with which we emit and the time scale over which we feel the impacts. Let's suppose, miracle upon miracles, we suddenly take climate change seriously and everyone does what they need to do in order to address CO2 emissions and to restructure our energy system. What happens next is sea level continues to rise, glaciers continue to melt, and all of the impacts to ecosystems and human life continue to happen. How do we message the need to continue to stay the course when people are saying, we've done everything you've asked and we're still facing horrible climate change? That is what worries me most. Professor Inhofer. I agree, but what I would like to highlight here is over the last two decades or three decades, we haven't done what we can. No. That's, that, that's a simple fact. And there is one very compelling, very compelling figure in the most recent IPCC report. This figure shows the still increasing emissions, and then it shows the technological progress we made in renewables, uh, photovoltaics, wind, solar dominance. A, a dramatic decline in costs. Nobody can ignore the potential of innovation which we have seen on the market. But still, emissions are increasing. And still, we are investing, we, means basically also in Germany, we built, by the way, 10 new coal-fired plants after the phase out of nuclear power in Germany. So in, it's not only in China and India, it's also in the smaller Asian countries like uh, Vietnam, like Indonesia, like Bangladesh, they have invested a lot in coal, despite of the declining costs for renewables and other carbon-free technologies. And then as a social scientist, and forget about our internal uh, talks and fights within economics, so take a little bit the broader social science perspective. Why is this the case? And from my point of view, there is one very dangerous myth in social science, unfortunately, very, very popular among natural scientists. And this is the following. They say, listen, we have a climate problem. Let's communicate the urgency of action. And then we will see a lot of action. And then basically we see a diffusion of norms, of attitudes, of habits around the globe. And this in the end will solve the climate problem. Social scientists call this, the climate solve is a coordination problem. It is not a coordination problem. It is fundamentally a cooperation problem. And cooperation problems are very hard to solve. Eleanor Ostrom has shown that at the global scale, we are in a quite good position to solve global, com global uh, common problems, uh, uh, local uh, common problems. But it is very hard to do this for at, at the global scale. And we haven't invested too much time and we have not invested the most important intellectual resources to figure out how to solve the, the cooperation problem. And therefore, I doubt when we basically uh, 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 ex explain people more that there is quite urgent. And there is a lot of urgency. There is no doubt about this. So the first and important thing is how can we solve this? At the global scale, all these international agreements have to be voluntary and self-enforcing. And the Paris Agreement is voluntary, no doubt about this, but if you look at the Paris Agreement, this has two major flaws. The first one is the voluntary contributions of the nation states are, are not ambitious enough, number one. 
but even the voluntary contributions they put on the table uh, are not credible at all. So some people argue, okay, if we take into account all the voluntary contributions of the nation states, we might be on a 2.7 pathway. But this would be only true if this voluntary contributions would be credible, but they are not credible. We are not on a 2.7 degree pathway, we are on a 4 degree pathway. So there is basically, the, 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 the commitments are not credible and we are absolutely on the wrong pathway. And therefore I suggest, and this is basically something, and this is not just to take action, but to think very hard about this, what can we do to solve at the global, at the European, and at the national scale, our cooperation problems much more effectively. Professor Winkelmann. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Maybe just to add to that, how can we go from the coordination to a cooperation um, solution? I think um, this is where it's so important um, to see how natural sciences and social sciences and the humanities work um, together. So um, just, um, yeah, I, I was, for instance, part of a project called the Dominoes Project, which is on domino effects in the Earth system, so in the human Earth system, um, looking at interactions between climate tipping elements and then what we see in terms of um, behavior, but also attitudes um, in the social uh, systems and societies. And I think um, what we find is that there are actually three main differences between um, tipping elements in the climate system and then some of the social processes. Um, for one, it's the complexity, and I think we've addressed this um, a lot here today. The second one is the scales, so spatial scales, but then also the time scales again. Um, so social processes work on generally much faster time scales, and also decisions need to be taken faster. I mean, if we think about the financial markets, it could be down to microseconds. And then lastly, uh, the third difference would be that the social is networked. So we need to think of this um, as a multitude of adaptable, <laughs> adaptive networks. And this is a very complex problem to solve and uh, one that certainly requires the uh, collaboration and cooperation also among scientists, but then especially the cooperation, as you say, on a political level. <coughs> Professor Makutsu, yes. Oh, the cooperation issue. Um, well, that's where economists may say something about it, the dif different type of uh, attitude. Um, I just want to give you two examples. One is uh, work has been done not just Eleanor Ostrom, but uh, a colleague of, of my University of Massachusetts, Sam Bowles, he made uh, um, a research to show when and how people manage to cooperate. And he's taking the example of broker in Chicago or uh, Wall Street and whale hunter somewhere in the north of, of, of Europe. And the result of this research shown that what really helps uh, people to cooperate is the whenever it, it can be proved to, to each of the agent that is really more profitable to cooperate. Is there in their own interest uh, to reach that result? In other words, um, we have to get out the so-called fallacy of composition thing, namely that people believe that pursuing an individual interest uh, gets you there. While it can be proved that sometimes if you don't take into consideration the effects that your action has, the kind of externality that you produce, in the end, goes against you. So I think that we have a tradition in economics that explain how what, what needs to be done is to really experience situation in which cooperative games, so to speak, play out. And I believe that uh, we have examples that show that uh, uh, non-pricing incentive, there are incentives that helps people to, to behave. And just to going back to the, 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 the founder of, of uh, uh, political economy, namely Adam Smith, he was the first to point out that the human being, society, could not hold together if only the principle of pursuing individual interest. Uh, because society uh, can 
all together, also other element play out. And I think that we should find out ways in which we, um, we use this incentive to make clear that what is good, a, a co what cooperation does is really make your individual interest to be obtained. We hand over the question to Professor McNutt. Would you agree? Well, I, I agree, but I also think that ultimately what is going to produce climate action is not necessarily climate change. So uh, I, I'm very influenced by a Harvard um, psychiatrist by the name, or psychologist, I think, Dan Gilbert. And Gilbert has looked at from the time of Neanderthals up to today, what has influenced our brain to actually fear something. And all of the four fear factors that he brought up are not apparent in climate change. It's happening too slow. CO2 is an odorless, um, uh, uh, invisible gas, so it doesn't create revulsion the way horse manure did on the street. And, um, and, and other problems, it's just, since it's happening everywhere, we don't see the, the discontinuities from one place to another. So uh, if I look back at the US, what has most caused the close down of coal-fired power plants in the US was arguing human health, that the mercury was contaminating the environment, making uh, wetlands um, uh, unsafe to uh, eat the fish from them and other things like that. And so I'm thinking in the end, when, this, when we finally reach a tipping point in this energy transition, it's not gonna be because people fear climate change. It's going to be because um, solar power, wind power are cheaper, they're quieter, they're less polluting, and they're simply more desirable. And I see this happening in these rural electric cooperatives all across the US, which are actually on the forefront of adopting um, alternative energies. And they do it on a cooperative basis, but on a local cooperative basis. Professor Innova, you wanted to add something. Yeah, f first of all, I, I, I agree, but that's not good enough if we want to achieve carbon neutrality by mid of the century. So the co-benefit story is a wonderful story. And uh, Thomas Stocker knows very well that within the IPCC, we had endless debates about the role of co-benefits. It's just fine. But just to rely on co-benefits, saying on human health uh, and, and, and on human well-being, this is not radical enough in order to achieve the carbon neutrality by the mid of the century. And one aspect I would like to highlight here is, and this is quite important. So, Ricardo talked about tipping points into the natural system. And obviously you think if there are these tipping points, there must be some resonance in, in the social system about these tipping points. And you highlighted there must be social tipping points, for example, uh, attitudes, and you mentioned the financial markets. And indeed we have some social systems where there are tipping points and there can be a, a very fast dissemination of attitudes. But I would argue to provoke you a little bit here, these attitudes are for the climate change issue almost completely irrelevant. Why they are irrelevant? We should focus our research not on these fast social tipping points, we should focus why is there so strong inertia in the social systems? This is the relevant question. Why there is so much uh, inertia, why it is so complicated? Why it is so hard to, 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 to achieve this, this cooperation? This is the relevant question in order to block this. And here I would argue that at, at the global scale, we could do very simple and very pragmatic steps. For example, we could use the multilateral development banks. There are hidden giants and they could do a, an incredible job. And I give just you an example. What if the Asian Development Bank, and by the way, this is not just speculation, so this is uh, uh, plans which are underway. What about the following, when the Asian Development Bank will simply buy coal-fired plants in the smaller countries like Vietnam and Indonesia? And then they provide the, these countries 
for, a, let's say, for the next 10 years or for the next five years, a revenue stream, provide them also subsidized loans, and in the end, this could help them to build up a renewable energy system with very uh, uh, low uh, credits and, 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 and low supports. So this is something which could be done immediately, and, and this is something uh, development banks could do. So why is there an incentive for these banks? This is hard to, 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 to figure out, but there are at least some people who think about this. And to use these large agents to, to help smaller countries to transform the energy system could be at least a starting point for bilateral uh, action and to help Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh to build up a completely new, at least, uh, power system uh, in the next five to seven years. So this could be a quite concrete step and if we would be successful with this kind of cooperation, this could be then also a role model uh, for, for other countries. And that's an interesting field. Before I hand over to you, ladies and gentlemen, for your questions, uh, Professor Winkelmann, could you tell us a little bit more about the social tipping points that we were just mentioning? Of course, how are the social tipping processes a, a potential key driver towards climate action? Yeah, just to respond also to your uh, comment, Otma, I think it is incredibly important to understand what are the hurdles to go from understanding from our knowledge about climate change and anticipation of impacts to action and actually to go through the, the chain of anticipation via concern to action. What are the hurdles? Why is it that uh, we have not achieved cooperation exactly as you flag out? And I think this is where uh, social tipping dynamics and our standing of this can actually help because we're not thinking about social tipping in the same manner that we're thinking um, about climate uh, tipping. And that is, um, we're not thinking that there is one particular driver or critical threshold, and once we have crossed that, um, there will be a, a change um, throughout the whole system. Rather, we're thinking about this in terms of what are the critical conditions for change. So, for instance, which network structures or topologies can foster cooperation? So, this is kind of our understanding of the network dynamics and uh, also the adaptive networks um, that can maybe help in understanding what these hurdles are. Um, so, just to clarify, I think this is this is where we actually agree um, that um, yeah, both the natural and the social sciences um, can help us understand what these hindrances are. Thank you. I'll have a look around. Do you have any questions to our panelists? Give me a hand sign. Wonderful. I see one hand. Yes. Great. We start with you and then we continue with your question. Thank you very much. Okay, it's been a great panel. Martin Wisberg again, uh, ocean scientist from Geoma Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Kiel. But actually, I have a question which touches on two points. I know some of you weren't here this morning for Thomas Stocker talk, but I think point two of his seven points was uh, that polluter pays. That concept I didn't see in the paper. It is the concept that is the toughest one in the negotiations you and FCCC, in particular for G7 countries. So I wanted you to react a bit on that one because that is the one reason why we're not making much progress. And I want to take another example, now speaking for the international science community, when we listen to this debate, and I take my friends from the African continent, they will look at you, well, guys, I mean, that is a very much a Northern European sort of debate because we're thinking about food security, energy security, all of that. And Otmar, you just touched a little bit on that. But remember, African continent is the one with the biggest population growth coming upon us in the next 30 years. They're possibly, they're speeding up in their technology development. We heard great example this morning from the response to COVID from Africa. But it is an element that somehow I'm missing in the debates and discussions that you had. So what would you say to our colleagues from, quote, the global south in that arena? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's start with the first question, and then we go to the second question. Professor McNutt, would you start? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Martin, for those questions. Um, first of all, let me say that um, I think that, oh, this is, I think I was going to hit the second question. What was the first question again? Polluter pays. Polluter pays. Um, I agree. 
That's easy. <laughs> Professor Inova, anything to add, or is it can we do the round as fast? Of course, I agree with truth and with beauty and all fine things in the world. But the problem is, I fully. By, by the way, it is in the paper. Carbon pricing is about polluter pay. It's about the polluter pay. But to give you just one number, and I, I don't want to be cynic, if it would have a, a globally carbon price of zero. This would be a huge step forward because we are subsidizing one ton CO2 at the global average with $150 at average. That's the subsidy. And Thomas Stocker knows very well, so we shared the same pain in, during the IPCC process, how tough it was when we want to write within the IPCC report uh, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies is something which should be done. And you know the countries who basically add only phasing out efficient, inefficient subsidies. So what are, by the way, efficient and inefficient subsidies? It's a violation of the polluter pace principle. So that, that's, that's a fundamental thing. But let me highlight one important thing. And this is, this is from my point of view, very, very important. I did a few papers with, with, with colleagues. Polluter pay principles can only work can only work if you provide huge transfers to the developing countries. That's a simple fact. A, un a unified carbon price at the global scale, scale will never be feasible without strong transfers. And designing these transfers in a smart way, which basically enhances international cooperation, is an important matter in its own right. So we, we are working on this, but I think this is absolutely crucial because Polluter pay has to be complemented with other justice principles. So, and, and without that, we cannot be successful. And this brings me to a, the second point on, on Africa. I couldn't agree more that Africa is enormously important. But Africa, despite of the enormous uh, endowment with renewable resources, is on a carbonization pathway. There are many, many countries who have plenty of, of, of renewable, at least an endowment uh, for, for renewables, investing in coal-fired plants. And this is not something which is in the 30 years ago. It's, it's, it's an ongoing process. And I agree. When we talk in Africa about a climate agenda, you have to embed this climate agenda in food security, energy security, human development, and, and so on and multilateral development banks will play an enormous role and by the way it's something positive so this bilateral agreement with south africa in phasing out coal is from my point of view a very very important example because we have to show that it is successful for a country like south africa to live without coal so we did a case study in africa and we asked many people there why do you invest so much in coal and you know what is the main reason the main reason is not some cost, small cost-benefit analysis. Many leaders in Africa believe that coal, investing in coal-fired plants is important for them for their overall economic in, uh, uh, development investment. The elites want to have this, this, uh, capture this coal rents. And, and therefore, you need a kind of a, a contract be, between the elites and the renewable energy providers. And this is something which has to be, be done in a, in a very smart way. I'm only afraid that we are running out of time to do such complicated things, but we should start uh, this. And I think what I would like to highlight here is to understand these processes. I was very puzzled. We did a book on the political economy of, of coal, where we did case studies in Asia and in Africa. And it is really very, very astonishing uh, to what extent people really believe that despite of climate change, uh, still, coal is a profitable investment. And to convince them, this is a very tough thing. Professor Winkelmann, is this a too Eurocentric discussion that we are having when we talk about including the Global South, different African stakeholders and partners and friends? I think this is a really important question because it addresses um, the, the problem of climate change and climate impact also as a justice problem. 
And I think there are two main dimensions of justice that we need to think about. And one comes from the great acceleration, so the fact that we see exponential growth in all kinds of indicators in the biophysical Earth system, but then also in the, the social systems. Um, so that introduces the notion of intergenerational justice. How do, do we deal with the fact that we are leaving these impacts up to future generations? And the second dimension is um, what comes about through the, what we would call the great inequality, exactly what you addressed. The fact that the burden of these impacts is completely unjustly distributed over the planet. And I think this introduces the, the notion of um, international or, and also intercommunity justice, and we need to address both of them equally. Mm. Professor Makutsu. Uh, talk about just transition and all the questions that are coming up now. No, I think this question about Africa is really important, but it's not just important for climate change, it's important for the pandemia, it's important from the exploitation of natural resources. Um, yes, I think we are a bit Eurocentric, but this is what G7 is about. Uh, but I, I fully agree with you. Uh, this is a major issue and uh, maybe what I feel is missing in the discussion here is the question of interest conflicts, conflict of interest, um, major cooperation behind exploitation. In other words, the kind of argument that has been made also during the COVID pandemic, you know, the big pharma versus uh, the um, public health system. So even in the case of the climate change, I keep trying to find an answer to the question that's being raised. Why is it so difficult to do anything? Why is it so difficult? Well, why is it so difficult to stop buying arms in the United States? Why is it so difficult to stop uh, uh, the exploitation of resources in, in, in Africa? It seems to me there are so many things that seem very difficult to do because maybe there are uh, big interests behind it. And I think we should try to talk more about this interest. Shall uh, we talk more about the interest or shall we have and pose different questions, not talking and asking no, why. No, I think we, we should add. Uh, we had a discussion this morning, uh, like in the case of climate change to the tobacco industry and how it did work and so on. And we started, I think Marsha made a very good point by talking about the lobby, how the lobby was in the end defeated and so on. So I, I think we need to bring into the argument why not so much is done about climate stage, the carbonization and so on. Whose interests are there that may help us to understand what's going on? Thank you. We have one more question from the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, I'm also a medical student. And um, I think that we have been talking a lot about like regulations or strategies that could happen to avoid maybe one of these um, future dystopias that we've been talking about. and. One thing that was mentioned before was also that a much earlier um, strategy is the mindset and like the way that we interact with our surroundings, the way that we handle it. And I think that um, you have this generation, like myself included, um, that is willing to change their lifestyle, that is already living a lifestyle, even promoting it. And I see this generational gap that was shortly addressed already. Um, and I think this contradiction that I, that I experience is that a lot of young people are actually, as you, like quoting you, taking immediate action, um, showing citizen involvement and even leadership as being role models in many ways, but are still portrayed as something unadmirable or even punished or belittled for their actions. And I think like one question is why is it still, or do you have the feeling of this generational gap? How would we close it and why are other generations still refusing to follow positive examples from the young? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And I'm just looking through my notes because I'd like to pose a question to Professor Winkelmann. Um, talking about, of course, an engagement of different generations and overbridging generational gaps. Uh, Ricarda, until 2020, you've been a board member of the German Young Academy of Science. You also received the Young Scientist of the Year by the Academics and the Zeit Publishing Group. Um, talking about 
the question now. What is your take on that? Because you talk to a lot of young scientists, young uh, entrepreneurs, young activists. Where do you see the gap? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for that question, because I think it raises such an important point, and that is that um, generational gap, as you, as you call it, but it's also a communication gap, um, I think. And um, one of the most important um, points and prerequisites, actually, for that communication, um, and this was pointed out earlier also in our discussions about um, planetary health, is first of all, a one of the prerequisites is trust. That's trust in science, trust in government, trust in people. Um, and I think this is one of the things that, that you addressed. The young generation does trust in science, and that is why they're taking to the streets, um, why they're saying we need to push for much more urgent action, and this action needs to be taken not just by the young generation, but especially also um, by the older generations. The second, I think, prerequisite is to listen. Um, so I think we often forget that communication is a two-way uh, street, and that means um, listening in both directions and actually taking seriously what uh, the young generations are telling us and also taking seriously their fears, their doubts and their questions. So I think that's um, the first point I would like to make. Now to come to um, the, the Young Academy of Science, I think this uh, to me uh, was just a, a wonderful experience of um, how science can connect people. And that is not just among scientists, so uh, the Young Academy consists of um, scientists um, from very different disciplines. And one of the projects, for instance, that I was involved in was an expedition uh, to the Andes that we did with um, scientists from very different uh, backgrounds. So all the way from climate science through biology, um, through uh, actually chemistry and then also musicology. And I've learned so much um, through that experience. For instance, how can we deal with climate change in terms of acoustics? Um, this, to me, was one of the projects where not only did I experience firsthand all the different impacts of climate change, in particular in the Andes region, collaborating with our partners in Ecuador, but also um, it was a possibility to make visible some of these invisible changes that are going on. Um, CO2 in the atmosphere is an invisible gas, but also microplastics in the ice, for instance, that we found in the glaciers. That's almost invisible to the human eye. Um, we have changes in noise pollution, for instance, so that's also invisible. And just to bring that about and, and um, yeah, connect on that level, I think that to me was one of the, the most important experiences and also something that science can give us. And how does a glacier sound? I just got you know, a little bit of a radio station now in my head when you were saying, oh, we've got musicians with us talking and uh, you know, working with uh, the topic of climate change. So how, how does it fit together? Very different. I mean, there, there are some wonderful recordings um, of glaciers around the world, actually, um, just showing also how dynamic they are, because mm -hmm. we often think of glaciers as, yeah, well, it's frozen, so um, there's not a lot of movement. But in fact, what you can hear is all kinds of sounds that come from the meltwater within the ice, um, from what goes on underneath, from cracks opening up, and so on. So it really is also a way of understanding the dynamics um, of the glaciers and the differences between different glaciers worldwide. Another way of communication. Professor Magnet. If I can just add to this really great question, I think that young people all around the world are doing a great job of modeling good behavior, but they need to do more than that. They need to vote. Vote, 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 vote. And also start becoming politically active at the local level. You can do so much just as a county supervisor or as a, a member of a local commission in terms of pushing for bike lanes and pushing for alternative uh, transportation. But what I see in the US anyway, which may not be true elsewhere, is how much our elected leaders are number one influenced by corporate money. And corporate money is working against the best interests of the population. And that's why young people have to vote and let them know that that corporate money is not working in their best interests. 
But to add here, we all have to vote. I guess it's, it's, it's sometimes dangerous to also only blame one generation to be active. How do we get at the broader picture? A absolutely, I agree that everyone has to vote, but I just notice in the US anyway, that for too many elections, mm -hmm. the youngest generation has sat out the, the election and, and we can't afford that. I found an interesting quote from you. Um, you said global climate change is going to require much more collective action. It also requires ordinary citizens. What did you mean by that? How do we get the civil society more engaged? So one way that ordinary citizens certainly play into this is just by the fact that we are really strong consumers. And if we demand different products, then we're going to uh, drive what is actually available. So uh, right now in this country, the uh, electric car industry can't keep up with demand. And that's what we want to see is pushing for more demand for uh, alternatives to burning gasoline. Any more questions from the audience here? One question, wonderful. The microphone is around the corner. And another one, wonderful. We've got three minutes left, so... Friedhelm von Blankenburg, a geologist from Potsdam, but not that institute, another one. Um, that question, this question, uh, or your remark, uh, really touched. In this, in this statement on decarbonization, the word behavioral change only appears one short bit, but isn't that the most simple solution, especially if we consider that the the most wealthy 10% of the global population produce 50% of the carbon emissions. And I think many of the people in this room are probably amongst them. Um, we just need to scale down. It's so easy. And we don't even, it doesn't even cost anything. We don't even need all the precious critical metals that not, may not even be available globally to do the energy transition. So what is in the way of engineering a really useful behavioral change that may even increase quality of life rather than decreasing it? Why is that so impossible? A lot of question marks or who wants to answer? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 would like, I would like to answer to that. Um, so think about the, during the pandemic, and during the pandemic, we have reduced the emissions at the level of 2006. So when we stopped basically traveling. So this is a drastic behavioral change. And I would say there is a potential for behavioral change. And the most recent IPCC report has highlighted that there is a, 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 a lot of potential here, even a lot of emission reduction potential. But, but I would argue Behavioral change alone is, is, is not good enough. And, and I would like to give you a few examples why it is not good enough. So first of all, what we did is we have changed our cars over the last 30 years. We have imposed technology standards, and this was just wonderful. So the, thing, the, the individual car was much more efficient. But the problem was the cars become much more heavier and we have basically used the cars more and in the transport sector emissions are still increasing despite of that. So another thing is it is wonderful if you subsidize public transport, right? It's wonderful. So you could make it at a low cost so that everybody can use public transport. Plenty of experiments around the globe. You have more public transport, people use more public transport, but at the same time people realize now, the, 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 the streets are now a little bit more free and I can use the car more. So this has led to a situation where we have used uh, cars in, in the cities more. What I am saying, this is a typical, a typical experiment. So if you want to subsidize the public transport, what you have to do at the same time is you need a congestion charge within the cities. Otherwise, behavioral change will not lead to a situation of emission reduction. And this is a typical example why I believe social scientists are needed. Because we understand a little bit more there is plenty of rebound effects. So the most important experience over the last 30 years of environmental policies is that the rebound effect basically has outweighed by far behavioral changes and even policy interventions. And we know enough, meanwhile, how to reduce this rebound effect. But this rebound effect cannot be reduced individually but you need here some kind of policy, some, some kind of collective action, and then we are in the middle of, of the messy world of, 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 of collective action. But meanwhile, we are a little bit better to do this. We, we, we could do better. 
And, and, and we could convince people, okay, it's good that you use transport, but at the same time, you need in the cities congestion charges. And by the way, in Berlin, we are discussing this, and this is a very ongoing, a lively, and a quite complicated mm. debate. Thank you, Mr. Edenhofer. Ms. Markutze, would, would you like to... Behavioral change. Take your microphone. Yeah, sorry. I think we agree that social change is a quite complicated matter to produce it, and then the unintended consequences that follow up can be even more devastating than the reason. So we agree on that. One more question. Uh, I thought, I think one more hand. Yes, and this is the last question from the audience on the third round. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so thanks, Professor McNutt, uh, for starting to answer my, my colleague's question. Um, I'm on the board of the German Medical Students Association, and I agree that voting and engaging politically is, is a basic civic duty, but I think it's not enough. So I think a very relevant question for us as a student association is, what else can we do? What else should we do? What's your take on that? So I, I do agree that personal lifestyle choices are really important. For example, uh, at my home, I have solar panels on my roof. My electric meter runs backwards, so the electric company owes me money at the end of every year. I charge my electric car off those solar panels. But you know where my carbon footprint is? It's coming to meetings like this. And that's where I think we also need much better technology for how to remotely convene that has the same feel and benefit of coming together without us all getting on airplanes. We've, got, we've just got to stop that unless we come up with some solution for a carbon-free um, intercontinental travel. That is going to be the hardest part to actually get rid of. Thank you very much. This is your round of applause. Professor Dr. Ricarda Winkelmann, Professor Dr. Odmar Edenhofer, Professor Dr. Marcia McNett, and Professor Dr. Maria Christina Marcuzzo. Thank you very much. It's time for a coffee, I would say. We see each other again quarter past four. I'm looking forward to, to our last panel. So enjoy a cup of coffee. And um, I think I saw some cakes in the, in the kitchen. Enjoy it. And I'll see you soon again. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome Bernhard Beck in our audience hall here at the Museum of Communication. I hope you've enjoyed the coffee break and uh, I hope you're energized now with a lot of coffee and maybe delicious cake and sugar for the last round. For our final panel discussion, I also warmly welcome again, of course, our digital audience. Thanks again for tuning in, for joining us in our live stream. It's been a big pleasure to have you on board here, um, almost live and face to face. But I hope we all meet together and see each other again soon. Okay, I think we are ready for our last uh, big question of today. We had a lot of topics that we tackled on and a lot of keywords. And I don't know how your mind, uh, how full your mind is. My mind is full with a lot of questions that we need definitely a continuation of our discussion rounds. But uh, the question that is now on our heart and mind is where do we go now from here? Let's have an outlook on the future of G7 and the G20 policy advice by the National Academies of Sciences. And of course, I have a panel here again, and I'd like to welcome the president of the Leopoldina Science 7th year 2022, Professor Dr. Gerald Hauck. And we also have this round of applause. Yeah, it's still doable. We're live, so. <laughs> this is the magic of the live events. We still have to get a little bit of warm up in these times, but um, we're getting into it. We also have the president of the Science Council of Japan and the Nobel laureate in physics 2015. He's also the Science 7th chair 2023, Professor Dr. Takaki Kachita. Thank you. We also have the president of the National Academy of Science of Indonesia, the Science 20 Chair 2022, Professor Dr. Satrio Somantri Rojonegoro. I hope it was almost okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Wonderful. And last, but absolutely not least, we are very honored to have you here, and I'm very honored to welcome you, the president of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine, Professor Dr. Anatoly Saharotny. Thank you. What a full day, hey? Have you missed a hug? I'm ready for a beer. Oh. <laughs> when you reflect, um, not just on of today, but also of the process of the S7 process 2022, what memories will stay for you and what experience will stay in your mind? I mean, the, the meeting we had in, in Halle a few weeks ago, that was the first meeting ever in presence since I was selected president, which was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And to have those 40 international guests and, 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 and people from, from the country, a total of, of 60 people, to, to really work hard on those texts, but also the level of, of, of consensus we could develop in two days, that was probably yes, the, the most wonderful post-pandemic process. And in days like today and when, I, when I've been last Thursday looking at what our ministers are doing and so on, I wish the world would be, and we've heard some of that, overall as rational and consensus-oriented as we have been there in Halle. Mr. Kachita, when we look ahead, of course, we are now filled with questions and ideas and topics and debates. But of course, um, the next process, the next S7 process is just around the corner, 2023. So can you share with us maybe your perspective on this year's topic, when you reflect on this year's topic, and how you're planning to filter and to take the debates and the questions of today with you that it's not a stop here, it's just a continuation. Okay, thank you. Well, certainly uh, this year's topic, uh, climate change and health, are critically important. In preparing G Science Academy meeting next year, we see continuity is one of the key factors to, to decide the topic for the meeting 2023. <clears throat> well, certainly, um, according to the most recent science, we may face more and more serious impacts over time, 
we must take urgent actions to tackle climate change. Also, um, after experiencing COVID-19 situation, we are now, now fully aware of importance of preparedness for such pandemic. <clears throat> so, uh, to address these in increasingly complex challenges, such as climate change and pandemic, I'd like to highlight, as the minister told us this morning, uh, collaboration among various academic areas, including humanities and social sciences, is gaining more importance than ever. So it's cr crucial that we, we are consistently seeking a way to solve the issues by bringing together the wisdom of all the academic disciplines. And in fact, um, Science Council of Japan uh, is composed of all areas of uh, sciences from uh, humanities, social sciences, life sciences, natural sciences, and engineering. So um, we would like to contribute to enhance interdisciplinary work to address these issues. And may, may I say? Absolutely, a yes. Yeah. Well, for the next year's uh, meeting, uh, in fact, we are planning to hold the meeting in early March in Tokyo, and we are certainly planning to have the next year's meeting in person, meeting, not the remote one. <laughs> uh, well, certainly, um, the in-person meetings are really important for deep discussions, and I'd like to thank Leopoldina for this meeting. And well, certainly about the topic, um, we have not decided anything. We have simply started the discussion, internal discussion, but certainly, as we discussed today, climate change and health are very important issues, and also the continuity is important. So we would like to decide based on the discussion today and also hearing various and advices from various academies. And we'd like to welcome you to Tokyo next year. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this invitation. Next March. We'll see each other all again. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, uh, Professor Kachita. When we talk about Science 20, I head over to Professor Satriou. Um, of course, maybe you can give us an insight what's important for you uh, when you look on the current process, um, but also, of course, about the debates and discussions that we had today, what echoes, and we'll go on to echo some discussion points that we had um, on the road of the S20. Thank you. Uh, after uh, following the today discussion, regarding the S7 uh, commitment. I noticed that it's quite uh, in line with what the S20 is trying to uh, <coughs> come up with a strong uh, recommendation by September 15, 2022, when we conduct the S20 summit. Uh, why I mention this is uh, in line? Because um, according to the S20 uh, draft of communication, as you may know that the G20 Indonesia Presidency has the theme of recover together, recover stronger. And for the engagement group of S20, we already uh, decide 
there are five priority issues. The first one is building resilient health systems. Second one, enhancing adaptive capacity of climate change and health systems. Third one is bolstering multidisciplinary science and technology for climate change and pandemic preparedness. Number four, guarantee that people are at the center. Number five, strengthening the nexus between data research policy practice for climate change and pandemic preparedness. Thank you. Thank you very much for your outlines. Uh, I come back to some points later on, so on the second round. I just want to use now the possibility to talk, of course, with all of you, with Professor Zaha Rodney. Coming from Ukraine, I think you've arrived two days ago or last night. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But please also share with us your thoughts and, of course, your perspectives towards the G7 and the G20 and the expectations that you have from your perspective now coming from a country which is tremendously suffering right now. Uh, dear, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it's a great honor uh, and pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf, on behalf of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. First of all, I'd like to uh, express my gratitude to the President of Leopoldina, Professor Gerald Hauk, for his kind invitation to participate in this uh, high-level panel and to uh, talk about the current situation in Ukraine. I also like to express my gratitude to the presidents of the S7 National Academy of Sciences group for the statement supporting Ukraine, supporting Ukrainian science and condemning the Russia's aggression of Ukraine. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with the current situation uh, in the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, which is the most influential research organization of our country and the largest organization. Uh, according to the National, just briefly about our academy, since the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine is different from um, the academies of sciences in many countries, European countries, I'd like to, to say just a couple of thoughts about our academy. Uh, according to the National Ukrainian legislation, the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine is the highest scientific institution of our country, responsible for basic and applied research uh, in natural and social sciences. We have about 28,000 employees, 15,000 researchers between them. Uh, we have in our structure about 150 uh, organizations. These are research institutes, libraries, botanical gardens, uh, uh, natural reserves, museums, and so on. So it's a rather large, large organization, you see. Uh, uh, in spite of many problems, uh, of many problems, uh, uh, our academy still uh, keeps rather good position in various fields of science, uh, such as uh, high energy physics and astrophysics, uh, uh, solid state physics, condensed matter physics, uh, molecular biology, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> closer. Closer. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, uh, to contribute to the uh, main point of today, uh, I'd like to say that the, national, the institutes of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine are deeply involved to the problem of climate change, to, to the problem of decarbonization, and we consider this problem as multidisciplinary problems, uh, economists, physicists, uh, astronomers, radio astronomers. Um, uh, we, we also uh, monitor the uh, uh, cosmic, uh, cosmic uh, sp space weather uh, and many, many other issues. 
and uh, and uh, uh, I already said we have uh, large national reserves and we, and we can uh, monitor the situation uh, with uh, uh, with the natural reserves with the Black Sea uh, and so on. But now I'd like to come back to the problem uh, of the current state of uh, science in Ukraine, and uh, I'd like to say that uh, of course. Uh, the war started by Russia considerably changes lives of uh, all Ukrainian people and uh, scientists uh, as well. How does your life, or how did your life change? Uh, how my life? Uh, I uh, na now we work uh, e extensively about the problems which uh, our state need to solve. Um, we uh, work without uh, holidays, uh, without uh, practically without vacations, uh, and so on. And we understand. Our uh, my colleagues understand that it should be. It should be. Uh, so uh, you see that uh, uh, many cities and villages have been, and uh, uh, now continue to be under the uh, artillery and uh, uh, rocket attacks. Just a couple, a couple of days ago, new attack, uh, the, the Institute for Sin Crystals, for example, in Kharkiv was attacked, and uh, um, just 10 or 15 meters before the main entrance, you, uh, there is an unexploded uh, projectile. Terrible. Terrible. And many buildings are, are damaged. But you see that. Uh, uh, hmm, uh, uh, you see that uh, civilian people uh, are dying, including children. According to the uh, General Prosecutor Office uh, of Ukraine, uh, 232 children uh, have been killed and 480 wounded. It's terrible figures. Terrible figures. Um, about 2,000, about 2,000 educational institutions, universities, secondary schools are damaged. 172 are completely destroyed. That's why in 24 regions of Ukraine, uh, teaching are in the online format. In 12, in 12 regions, we have blended format. Heavy damages. Uh, um, uh, we have in the Institute of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. In Kyiv, in Kharkiv, mainly very heavy damages. Uh, in, in Kharkiv, in, in Sumy, in Dnipro. Um, so uh, now, now we are uh, doing our best to, to repair what we can do. How but do you some, some, some damages are to. to, to not too large that uh, we can, cannot do this. And what uh, I have drawn your attention is that, for example, famous, very famous Kharkiv uh, Institute of Physics and Technologies uh, was mm, attacked many times, many times, many buildings are destroyed completely. And uh, uh, you see, I, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, newly created facility, nuclear uh, subcritical assembly, neutron source, Neutron source have also been attacked a few times, and building and the equipment of this facility destroyed. But this is a nuclear facility. This is a nuclear reactor, subcritical reactor. And fortunately, fortunately, uh, uh, there have been uh, radiation leakage uh, at the, um, as yet. But uh, in the case of more uh, powerful shelling, uh, we, we can uh, expect uh, the disaster of the order of Chernobyl, Chernobyl disaster. I can continue yes. such such mm -hmm. such examples. Uh, uh, you see that uh, I'm sorry, but I have to say that, for example, uh, also the laboratory of the uh, uh, Institute for Nuclear Plant Safety uh, completely destroyed. Completely, uh, but this laboratory uh, mm, uh, carried out. Uh, uh, scientific support and monitoring of the state of nuclear uh, nuclear matter uh, in the so-called uh, shelter object. Do you know shelter objects is a uh, is an object in which the rest of uh, uh, Chernobyl reactors are, uh, are kept now? And uh, you see that it's, it's very dangerous not, not to have control of the situation, the temperature, humidity, the level of radiation, and so on. So it's uh, it's a big problem.
big problem. And uh, as I say, I can continue uh, continue the list, uh, this list of damages. And uh, thank you for telling us. The one thing is, of course, the con the that buildings get destroyed. But the other thing is, of course, that connections get destroyed. So one thing is to rebuild, hopefully, very soon houses and educational institutions. But how would you say what is possible? How do you build up again the scientific family? the connections within the science in your country. Is that possible? And if yeah. so, can you share some ideas? What, what is in your mind? Uh, uh, just a uh, just couple of words about the, um, uh, our staff. Our staff, uh, about 1,900 of our researchers are now abroad in Poland, in Germany, in France, uh, somewhere else. And about uh, 3,000 uh, uh, and 500 uh, uh, people from the academy moved from their places, permanent places, to western part of Ukraine. So we, we have really big problem. We, we, we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, you see that uh, the uh, researchers uh, uh, which are now uh, abroad, abroad, uh, the, these are women women and uh, representatives of all the generation. So of course, we believe that they will come back and family will be, will, will, will be united. So uh, what, what uh, uh, you ask uh, how we can... Uh, uh, Build up again the connections the, to avoid brain drain. To avoid brain drain. Uh, ah. Nice question, nice question. You see that, of uh, first of all, we are uh, deeply grateful for any kind of support, particularly for the support for accepting our researches in the institutes uh, uh, in the European countries. But, but for us, it's even more important to, to keep keep young researchers which are uh, working, still working uh, in Ukraine. And uh, uh, we, need, uh, we need some financial support for them, not for everybody in the academy, but especially for young researchers, especially for them. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, already um, uh, some, uh, some uh, programs uh, uh, has been launched, for example, uh, uh, for example, the Institute, uh, Volgar Pauli Institute in Austria, uh, in Austria uh, uh, launched two calls to support, to, to provide uh, individual support for uh, uh, scientists. Uh, the Austrian Academy of Sciences also, also launched a call to support, to support Ukrainian scientists with the possibility to get salary uh, in Ukraine. And uh, we also uh, deeply thankful to, to the Max Planck Society, which also announced two calls to calls for young researchers, uh, 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 grants for young, uh, young researchers in Ukraine with the possi possibility to get salary in Ukraine. So we hope that such practice will be continued and we are deeply grateful. Mm -hmm. This, uh, this uh, save our young generation. It's extremely important. Thank and you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Hawk, when we talk about reconstruction um, at this stage it's difficult of course but how can the g7 and the g20 committees support reconstruction of the scientific family or where do you see ideas and visions in your talks i mean i i assume you are in conversation with a lot of different stakeholders um, policy makers what are options and ideas i mean we some of us fly with professor Zagorodny together to warsaw tomorrow to to talk with our polish colleague on what we could could do directly. And I'm a little embarrassed here when I talk to Marsha McNutt. She collected four million dollars for immediate help. I don't say how much I've collected, but it's pathetic. So I hope that we also as a European as European countries can can help immediately. The Max Planck Society has been mentioned. So I hope to have tomorrow an opportunity to, to pitch in the program. And as, as um, Anatoly, you've said it, it's the young, it's the young scientists which are the key. So I think if, if we could help with stipend programs uh, to, to help for a while also at our institutes in our countries or what we've done with the Polish Academy on, on the US initiative, I think that's the most immediate help we can provide. But I think it's particularly the young scientists which we need to keep afloat. 
Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I did not mention the French Academy of Sciences, which also helped our young research. Uh, they sent us some money which we distribute between the young research in, in Kharkiv mainly, since uh, they need, uh, mostly need such support. Thank you very much. When we talk now again, of course, about uh, possibilities of academies in these times and um, when we look on the Leopoldina academies, again, Professor How, what role of the academies do you see when it comes again to policy consultation, when it comes again to telling success stories, but also, of course, shedding light on what's not going right and which is not going okay-ish. <laughs> so where is the responsibility of the Leopoldina family in that regard? Yeah. I mean, what we do as academies, we we bundle knowledge, right? Our academy members, the, the Leopoldina has 1,600 members, and I, I don't know the details of the other academy, but it's, it's probably at the similar stage for all fields of science, from, from the natural sciences, we have very big medical class life sciences, and also the humanities. I think the pool of knowledge we have is extraordinary. In this country, we bundle everything from university professors to, to, to the Max Planck Society. The same is true, I know, for, for all the other academies who are which are sitting here. So I think we have the duty to tap in, in this pool. When we do those statements, if you look at those texts, I mean, these this were, at the end, probably 60 to 80 top uh, uh, colleagues uh, in, involved to prepare those statements. That's, that's the best we can do. Usually we write those 200 pages with 100 pages of literature, uh, literature and, and references. That's one of the aspects of the academies. But then it's this leadership-like statements which we've provided here. And I think the good aspect is, and you've, we've seen this at, at the internal discussion with Minister Schmidt, but with many of the other policymakers and stakeholders, uh, given the depth of knowledge um, those academy members have, which we can bundle, I think there's a great respect that there's not any goofy text basically coming out, uh, there, that there's a real in-depth knowledge underlying those, at the end, short statements. And I think to do this, and to do this as honest brokers in a very direct, straightforward way to point out what is the progress, but also I'm a climate, a marine, ocean climate scientist. I do this in 30 years in a sincere matter. And, and to, to go to Zurich last, last Tuesday, I taught at ETH my, 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 my second semester class again in ocean and climate and explained with ice ages where we stand and, and what the carbon cycle is doing and what man has done. And I had to update my slide to a complete new level, having not taught for three years because of the pandemic. I think that's the duty we have, and, and as we've pointed out a couple of times today, man is not on track on so many fields, as we seem to have clear lack in rationality, also amongst our global leaders. That's, that's one of the sad truths. We have to find this ways to cooperate. We, we have the tools in hand, we have the, the techniques in hand, the science has played a big part in development, but now it's an implementation issue, and we have to keep pointing it out. And we talked a lot today about communication, also about communication with policymakers. Um, Professor Kachita, why do we need the scientific advice that we were just pointing out for policymakers? Why do we need to be more, or at least a little bit, in contact and in communication? What is, yeah. what is your answer to that when you see that combination that, and that request for communication between science and policymakers? Well, okay, thank you. I think we have a recent example, COVID-19 pandemic. Well, certainly in order to attack this issue, uh, we need the scientific uh, knowledge. So, and therefore, um, we have, well, academy have, uh, have to communicate with the society and also with the government policy makers in order to minimize the effect of the pandemic. So uh, this is just one example, but well, certainly um, nowadays we have many other issues that need scientific input. So therefore, I think this is a very important thing for the academies.
Professor Satrio, do we need scientific advice also for the public? I mean, that was also some, a question of today, how to communicate with the civil society and more and more with the public. How do you see that? Uh, in many cases, we observe that some or not many policies um, uh, decided by the leaders, um, it, or they don't um, use the evidence base or scientific uh, evidence base, and therefore many of the policies uh, doesn't work because it, the policy doesn't solve the root of the problem because they don't use the scientific evidence. So that uh, <coughs> our academy, <coughs> um, in the law of uh, our academy, the mission is to provide uh, suggestion, uh, advice, advocacy, even to criticize the stakeholders, government, uh, private sector, and people at large. So then, uh, with that task of our academy, we regularly publish what we call the policy brief for many aspects, climate change, uh, food resilience, and <coughs> uh, biodiversity, uh, preservation, and many issues. But then we found out that <coughs> the policymaker somehow could not be understood or adopted by the, by the leader. They mentioned that, uh, sorry, it's too complicated. I cannot understand what you write in the policy brief. What do you want that? Okay. Then I feel, our scientists feel that, okay, sometimes the scientists feel, yeah, some of them feel that I'm the top person in this field. That is true. But then I challenge my colleague, but how can you make the people understand what you're doing? It's more important. Otherwise, what you uh, find, you invent in your research is just, uh, well, being uh, published in the journals. And then our academy developed uh, another program, what we call the science communications. Yeah? So we try to educate the public about science literacy. So that they know, they can understand, they can read, and they can uh, get the meaningful of this uh, scientific uh, evidence. But most important also for the leaders. Yeah. Uh, some of my colleagues say, I think we have to also, yeah, sorry to say, educate our leader to understand or to be able to read yeah, what is the content of the policy brief. Mm. Yeah. Uh, now, the importance of this advocacy is there, but still we have this uh, gap between what uh, we write in the policy brief, but uh, in many cases, the leaders say, um, we cannot uh, implement your uh, suggestion because there are other aspects, yeah, political aspect, uh, humanity aspect. While <coughs> I mentioned to them that, well, we are scientists. Uh, we are not uh, above anybody. We are same with everybody. So let's come up with a, a comprehensive uh, <coughs> approach so that the policy will be implementable for the stakeholder. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Satria. Thank you very much. I'd like to finish this panel discussion with um, a question to Professor 
Zaha Rodney, and we just heard we are all, as scientists, we are all one family. So the Leopoldina family, the science family, um, when I look around, we're all together. And also, of course, the question to you, Professor Zaha Rodney, what would you like us to keep in mind um, from your situation, coming from your situation? What is important for the family to not forget to help you in any way, not just, it's about reconstruction, yes, but also about, about rebuilding connections and the human connections in the science family. What is important for you to keep in mind? Yes, yeah, yeah. you see, I already uh, said that uh, for us, it's extremely important to know that civilized world, scientific world as well, uh, uh, have, uh, appropriate assessment of the aggression and uh, this situation with the all shows that uh, uh, we are among uh, civilized world and uh, of course uh, uh, we, it's uh, it's very uh, we are deeply touched by the uh, uh, solidarity and uh, support which we got from um, countries from the academies uh, you see that uh, we received um, maybe about 100 letters from the academies, from Leopoldina, from uh, uh, Max Planck Society, from many, many others, Swedish, uh, Royal Swedish Academy, Hungarian Academy, uh, all European academies. Uh, so, and we, uh, they, they, this, uh, 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 and we believe in our victory in such, in such community. Thank you very much. We are deeply touched. Deeply touched, and of course, uh, um, we like to uh, to extend our collaborations. And uh, this opportunity for me is very also important, uh, since uh, it would be possible to have a more uh, close contacts with uh, the presidents uh, of the S G7, S7 groups, and uh, not only. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that uh, we will have the future in cooperation with the Academy's family of Europe and international academies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Dr. Anatoly Zaharodny from right to left and Professor Dr. Satrio Somantri Progenikoro. You can round you can clap if you want to. <laughs> Thank you. Also to Professor Dr. Um, Kachati Kachita and of course to Professor Dr. Gerald Haug. And this is uh, yeah the final stretch of the day. What a day! Thinking together of crises with, um, without prioritizing one or the other crisis. It's far from being easy. That's what we've learned. But what can we learn from each other? That's also very important. And what can we learn from one crisis to be stronger next time? I hear a lot of a lot of times, and I mentioned it already um, here in my word cloud. Urgency, walk the talk. Um, let's fill this these sentences with life and um, not just with ink. I think that's a good, good thing to remember. Um, and before we're listening to the farewell words of today's dialogue forum, some last notes from me. Thank you again for joining us also today, ladies and gentlemen, virtually online. It's been a great pleasure to have you on board. Thanks for watching today. You can rewatch it again. It's going to be accessible at the YouTube uh, social media channels of the Leopoldina family. So thanks again for tuning in today. Please bring back to the audience here your translation devices. And thanks again for the interpreters for translating everything what we've said here. It's always a tremendous work. Thanks for the technicians. A round of applause for you guys um, for following along. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's a beautiful place we're in. And of course, it's a museum for communication. And um, there is a treasure jamba of the Museum of Communication. So 17 of the most valuable, famous or unusual objects from the collection of the museum, which are too valuable for display and too sensitive for daylight. So it's open now for you to spoil a bit. You might be interested in a legend as the Blue Mauritius, the most famous stamp in the world, is visible in that treasure jamba. So I hope this raises up your curiosity. Later on, the music will be played by a very great trio, the Trio Noor. And now I hand over to you. Professor Haug, thank you very much for the final words. And we can leave the stage. Thank you very much. So, distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, it, it was a wonderful conference in a wonderful setting. 
it's the time now for a thank you and farewell. I would like to thank everyone who contributed to this Science 7 Dialogue Forum. I want to thank all the speakers and panelists for their contributions and insights. Special thanks goes to the National Science Academies of the G7 countries for their dedicated commitment in the S7 process and the preparation of the joint statements. Dear Professor Kachita, thank you for giving us the introduction on the next Science 7 under the presidency of Japan in 2023. I very, look, very much look forward to continue our cooperation next year, starting tomorrow morning for breakfast. <laughs> Dear uh, Professor Satrio, thank you for the insights into the S20 process. I'm sure we will have an excellent joint statement for the G20 summit, and I look forward to our S20 meetings in Indonesia. Professor Zagorodny, Anatoly, thank you for coming to Berlin. We greatly admire your resolve. We will do everything in our power to support your academy and the scientific community of Ukraine in these difficult times. Stay safe. Last but not least, I would like to thank the Leopoldina staff for organizing the event. Special thanks to Marina koch krumrai and her team. <laughs> the Museum for Communication was a wonderful setting for the Science 7 Dialogue Forum. Thank you again for the privilege and your hospitality. Looking forward to the next year's Science 7 process under the leadership of uh, Japan, it's my pleasure now to invite you to a reception here. Enjoy the food, the drinks, I get my beer now, music and the opportunity to get personally in touch with each other. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to close the meeting and open the bar. Thank you.